To the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. We are here as always to talk about stuff, and this week, one of our favorite topics. Yes. We are talking Persona. Once again. It's Once been a long again. time coming. It's, it's, it's been a long time since we've had a Persona exclusive podcast. It's been since the soundtrack one, I think. I think you're correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you are one of our listeners who listens to us but does not know a lot about Persona... I'm sorry. We will be talking about other things at the top of the show, so don't turn it off just yet. There will be a good 20 minutes, half hour of content for you. Yeah. And then we are jumping into our fi- a re- official review and discussion of Persona 3, the movie, number three, Falling Down. Yes. Yes. So yeah, we've just gotten finished watching it. Yes. So if you have not heard, uh, you know, the Persona 3 movies have been turned into this quadrilogy of animated films. Uh, and we have been going through and reviewing them when they come out on Blu-ray in their international versions, which have English subtitles, yeah. and paying a shit ton of money to get those in and then do a podcast on them. These are easily our most expensive podcasts per capita. Yes. But if you are a Netflix subscriber and you're only interested in seeing Persona 3, the mo- movie number two of Midsummer Night's Dream, that one is available for streaming. Unfortunately, the Persona 3, the movie number one, Spring of Birth, is not currently on the Netflix service. Makes no sense, but no. you could listen to our podcasts, and you can go back and I didn't pull those episode numbers, but they are somewhere. You can find them. Just look at the tags and everything. And it's Persona Three, the movie number one, number two. They've been kind of a year apart, so this is our. Uh, and we get to do it again and talk about Persona Three, the movie number three. Yes, and it's kind of sad because now we're definitely past the halfway mark, three fourths after this, yeah. and one more movie to talk about. But hell, we can always find more Persona anime and shit. Eventually, there'll be the Persona Five anime. Yeah. There's always more Persona on the horizon. Yes. And this is, I feel like this is like the tip of the iceberg for 2016 and yes. Persona. Yeah, if you get used to that new number, Jonathan. It's tough. It is. Anyway, so we're going to talk about that. I mean, quick spoiler-free reaction. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. If you've watched those other movies and like those other movies, it is as good as those other movies. It might be the best one. Yeah, worth the $80 to import. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. Depends on how, if you've like never seen any of these... No. Yeah, it but, depends entirely on your level of enthusiasm. But, like, if it's only worth importing if it's a good movie. Like, yes. if it's not a good movie, no, despite your level of enthusiasm, it's never worth $80. Right. So, this one, I, I have sunk $240 into these movies so far, which, when I put it together, is terrifying. Yeah. But, been worth it. Yeah. I mean, you've probably spent $240, like, in, like, the course of three years on stupider stuff than three Persona movies. Yeah, just like food and shit. Yeah, exactly. Stuff that yeah. you don't need. Well, I mean, you need food. No, I could you know. probably get by on less. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Anyway. You can sustain yourself self off of the sweet nectar of Persona. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what I did when I was playing those games. I didn't get I, breaks to eat. I want that on like the Persona 5 box where they have like the critics' statement. It's, yeah. it's Sean Chapman, Weekly Stuff Podcast. You can sustain yourself off the sweet nectar of Persona. It's true. It's very true. All right, so Sean, let's just talk about some stuff. All right. Before we get into the main topic, I want to start by talking about Deadpool. Okay. I'll talk about the movie in a second because I saw the movie and it's great. But moreover, I am astonished. Have you seen the box office numbers for this? It has made a huge amount of money. Yeah. Not just a huge amount of money. So the, the weekend is $135 million. And you could import a lot of Persona 3, the movie number 3 with that. <laughs> you could, absolutely. I'm sure that's the first thing Ryan Reynolds is going to do. Probably. Yes. Hopefully. And, you know, it's going to have an even bigger take when they calculate the four-day weekend, because this is technically President's Day weekend, so that is a figure that exists, is the four-day weekend for holiday weekends. Right. So it's probably going to go above 150. But if you count that 135 million three-day weekend... That is not just one of the biggest opening weekends ever. I mean, that's on the list of yeah. biggest. It's the biggest ever for Fox as a studio. Oh, shit. I didn't know that. And it's far bigger than any other X-Men movie. <laughs> it's insane. Is it an X-Men movie? Is it really, though? It's very much so. Like, okay. if you actually go to see it, they, they, they name drop X-Men. You go to Xavier's house. Oh, that's surprising that yeah. they connected that much. It is. Sean, there is nothing about this movie that is not surprising 
And the fact that it's made this much money is by far the most surprising thing. And I bet it's most surprising to the people who made it yeah. who were probably bracing themselves for a flop. I mean, remember how, like, it, it's been years and years and years that they've been trying to make yes. this Deadpool movie. And, because they had the character in that X-Men Origins movie, but they completely fucked him over there. Yeah. And, like, they've, like, the people making this movie have been trying to make this movie for so long. And, like, they had, like, that test footage and stuff that got out at Comic-Con. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, clearly Fox thought that this was never going to bring in anything. Yeah. And it's a fairly low-budget superhero movie, as these things go. I mean, $50 million. It's still a lot of money, obviously. Yeah. That's not low budget by most standards, but by superhero movie standards, very low budget. And so, yeah, I mean, Deadpool has suddenly become the hottest superhero in Hollywood. And I think whatever your thoughts on the character, that's kind of wonderful. I mean, it's really appropriate for that character. Yes. Like, it gives them a lot of material to work with in the sequel, presumably. Yes, where Deadpool goes like crazy with fame. Yeah, where it's like all the money goes to his head because he's aware... Presumably, I haven't seen the movie, but I assume he must be aware at some point that he's breaking the fourth wall a little bit. That has to happen. A lot. Okay, good. Look, that's, I will say It wouldn't this. be a Deadpool movie if he didn't. Yeah, I, Sean, you should see this movie. I know I you're not a will, huge fan yeah. of Deadpool, but the movie is really good. And the thing that makes it so good is I, I cannot, off the top of my head, think of another superhero movie that was made with this much just sheer love and enthusiasm for the character. And of course... That would kind of have to happen for a Deadpool movie to come to the big screen and be anything other than a disaster. Yeah. It's for people to really love it. And, you know, I went to see this opening night, Thursday night. It was a sold-out show at the uh, Alamo Draft House, And so, you know, big auditorium. And I really, honestly, off the top of my head, cannot remember a room that was more excited for a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. I have to go back a long ways. Maybe Spider-Man 2... I didn't really see the Avengers on an opening night scenario, right. so it's hard to know. I'm just trying to think of like other ones people were really excited for. But everyone in that room, there were people dressed up as Deadpool. There were people in other costumes. There were people just you know casually just talking about it and how much they love the character. Alamo always does a fun pre-show, and they had a bunch of fun Deadpool stuff. They had like a live action movie of Deadpool and Spider Man playing basketball. They had yeah. a lot of clips from the Ultimate Spider Man show where Spider Man and yeah. Deadpool are hanging out. It and everyone was just eating it all up. And, you know, I have no prior history with Deadpool. My only, I don't read the comics, so I really don't know him from there. I saw the X-Men Origins Wolverine movie, and even not knowing Deadpool, I could tell they fucked him up. And I could tell Ryan Reynolds was sad. <laughs> he looks sad in about half that movie, because you can tell he loves the character. Yeah. And, and he's like, just keeps on looking at his contract for a loophole somewhere. It's like, yes. I just can't find it. Yeah. It's watertight. Yep. And, you know, so it was really tough for me to go into this movie without with anything other than excitement because that room was so excited for it and I love that like and you realize okay this movie win or lose you know good or bad is doing something that superhero movies have not done in a while if ever which is cater to a really specific niche right and say we are doing it folks we are doing the character you love and we're going to cater to your weird sensibilities and they do it. And it's really inspiring because I hope, especially because it's made all this money now, yeah. that the movie is good and it made all this money. I hope it can open other corners of different comic book universes, whether that's DC or Marvel, and just show that, yeah, you can go out on a limb, make it a hard, hard R rating, whatever you want to do, and this shit will work. Like between Deadpool and some of the things Marvel is doing on TV with like their Netflix deal, we're seeing a different side of superhero yeah. stuff, and it's really exciting. But no, the movie itself is great. It is so... Like, there is not a more accurate, on-point adaptation of a superhero out there. This is Deadpool through and through from the first minute onwards. The opening credits are maybe the funniest opening credits I've ever seen to anything. What they do is just so on-point for the character and just for the overall tone of the humor that comes with him. He's breaking the fourth wall constantly. He is making a joke every 30 seconds. He is the motor mouth in this. His mouth does not get shut, sewn shut. They directly reference the stupidity of the X-Men Origins movie. Good, yeah. There's a point where Deadpool calls out the strangeness of the X-Men continuity because of the prequels. All right. And stuff. It is great. And I, I think the movie has some rough spots. I don't think it's perfect. I think it has a really creative structure where the movie is basically just two big scenes. Which is, one is Deadpool is trying to find an enemy... And it's sort of on this big highway. You've seen it in the trailers. Yeah. And there's that scene. And then there's 
uh, what happens after that where his girlfriend gets kidnapped and he has to go rescue her. And in between that, in, in like the highway scene, where having that is kind of the present day stuff and then it keeps flashing back to the origin story material. And I do think, I love that structure because it keeps it fresh and moving and it allows yeah. Deadpool to have fun with narration and things. I do think there's a point where the origin story takes over a little too much and the movie drowns in it a little too much. But origin stories have problems. Like, yeah. that is not an issue that has not been had by a movie before. And this still feels fresher because it is still having fun with it and being silly and irreverent. And so there are points where I think, okay, you could have trimmed a couple minutes here. And this probably should have been a 90-minute movie instead of a 100-minute movie. But whatever. It's okay. Because when they get back to it, they get back to it and it works. And, yeah, it's just a ton of fun. Ryan Reynolds, who is an actor, I think has been impressive in certain scenarios. I think overall... I've never really liked him in anything. He is fantastic here. He's so good. And you can tell he just is loving playing this character. It is so clearly the role he was born to play because he's so good with irreverence and he's not good with sincerity. Right. And that's who Deadpool is. Yeah. And, I mean, just the fact that he has no ego in this movie. Like, the first time you see, I won't spoil the joke, the first instance of seeing Ryan Reynolds' face in the movie is making fun of his celebrity image. And it's great. And from there on out, I mean, he's... There are very few superhero movies where the superhero is in the suit this much. He is in the Deadpool suit for a large swath of the movie, not taking the mask off to talk like in well, Spider-Man 3. if it's Deadpool, like, taking the mask off is a, a, a reasonable solution to that problem. Yes, right? well, right. Because he's disfi- So either he's in the suit or he's in heavy makeup because Deadpool is disfigured. Yeah. And there's really only a small slice of the movie that's just Ryan Reynolds looking like Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. And for a guy who looks like Ryan Reynolds you got to commend him for that. That's yeah, kind of cool yeah. that he would do that and go in on it. Uh, the action is very well shot, even if you can tell it's lower budget. I mean, you know, they, they, this is not the Avengers, and that's okay. And I yeah. think for the kind of action Deadpool engages in, he is not saving the world. No. He's mostly killing people. Yes. So that's fine. It, it looks exactly as good as it needs to. I think the performances outside of Ryan Reynolds are all very good. Morena Baccarin, great and completely in on the joke for the love interest character she's playing. And somehow... The love relationship in this movie is legitimately one of the better ones in all of superhero cinema. Like, it would go near the top of just, like, that's good. It doesn't feel generic. It feels like these are two people meant for each other. It's great. And I think the movie, you know, it has... It is a Deadpool movie. It's got the, you know, sophomoric humor. It's very lowbrow in places. It's a little more clever in other places. It's joke a minute, which means not every joke lands. The ones that do, I think, land very hard. But it also it has a heart to it that I think is very clearly there, and I like that. And a lot of the heart just, again, comes from, you can tell everyone making this is, like, so excited to finally get to make the fucking movie, mm-hmm. because they've been trying for so long. And the way it integrates the X-Men mythos is actually really ingenious. There are basically two other X-Men who enter the movie. Uh, Colossus is okay. one of the main people, and he has brought his protege, which is Negasonic Teenage Warhead. <laughs> so they're really taking a, a random X-Men there. Right. And it's really funny what they do with those two characters. Yes, Deadpool just directly mentions, so the studio wouldn't pay for any other X-Men, huh? That kind of thing. And Colossus is really trying to recruit Deadpool and make him an X-Men and show him what it's like to be a hero. And of course Colossus is going to be frustrated for the run of the movie. Yes. All those things. So I like that. Like it's not even though it's hard R and is not on brand for the X-Men movies, it is an X-Men movie. Like it's clearly in that universe. And I like that, even though it would make no sense with the continuity of X-Men Origins of Wolverine, obviously. Right. Well, I mean, (laughs) there are so many problems with the X-Men continuity at this point that who cares? cares? And especially that movie. Like, that movie doesn't even add up with the continuity they'd introduced for Wolverine in X-Men 1, 2, 3. Yeah. So it's nuts. Have you ever seen that one? No. I've seen parts of it because my parents saw it once. when It was like on TV and they were watching it. I watched like 30 minutes of it or something. I was like, this doesn't... I'm not going to watch any more of this. And I'll say this. The best part of that entire movie is Deadpool for like the one scene where he gets to be Deadpool. Hmm. And that's like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then they sew his mouth shut. And the rest of the movie... I mean, it, that's not the only problem in that movie. It's, nope. it's symbolic of the other problems in that movie that you would take Deadpool and sew his mouth shut. Yeah. But like yes. that's... If you want any more evidence of like when a studio gets involved in a movie instead of like the creative people behind it... Yeah. That is that is a studio decision. Well, and it's it's just we were talking about this last week talking about the X-Men Apocalypse trailer that the X-Men series has had such a weird journey and part of it is because it started in an era of heavy studio interference in superhero movies. Yeah. When Fox clearly had no faith in this thing and Brian Singer was fighting tooth and nail to get 
anything cool in. You know, he wanted to use the Sentinels in both X1 and X2, couldn't get them in, things like that. Yeah. Couldn't get the yellow suits, none of that stuff. That you have things as relatively outlandish as Cyclops being in the movie at all was a miracle, you know. So, and we've come that far to have stuff as weird as Wolverine in Japan, yeah. and as cool as Days of Future Past, and now as off the walls, bonkers, insane as Deadpool, where it's not like the movie is this, you know, great artistic avant garde statement, but you do watch the entire movie jaw agape, going, I cannot believe this exists in the Hollywood studio system yeah. in 2016. This kind of thing just doesn't happen. And yet it did, and again, it made $135 million. How? I don't, I mean, it had, a, I think, a really good on-point marketing campaign that was out there and got the word out, but still, yeah. like, Deadpool does not have the name penetration to make that much money, but it kind of proves if you start from the ground up with your main fan base, you can build a bigger audience. Yeah. And also, like, if you have something that's very distinct in the market as well, yeah. where it's like, there's no, I mean, let alone superhero movies like Deadpool, there's no movies like Deadpool. Like, because there are no characters, I mean, there are some characters kind of like Deadpool, but it's like they are very few and far between, and they're never in the mainstream. No. So, yeah. He, like, he's Vulgar Bud's bunny. It's, it's an adult sure, Looney yeah. Tunes cartoon. And it's so committed to that. And, yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a really cool movie. It's a really fun movie. I tweeted this afterwards, and I think it could be true. It might legitimately be the best X-Men movie. <laughs> and that is the funniest thing about it. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll definitely see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now that, like... I've heard you talk about it and I've read some of the reviews and like knowing specifically what it is that people like about it. Yeah, like yeah. Because with the Deadpool character, it's always been it's not that I don't like him, it's that he's like super hit or miss, and when he misses, like those misses are the most obnoxious, annoying things you can ever find. So it's but when he hits, it's like there's nothing quite like it. So. Yeah, and I think this is a hit. It's it's very funny. I mean, if you know what you're getting going in, which is a funny, irreverent superhero movie that is always, you know, veering towards the more sophomoric then I think you'll enjoy it if you're up for that. If And again, you know, if that does not sound like something you want, don't go see it. That's okay. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's not going to be for you. But I think clearly it's for a lot of people. It didn't just make a lot of money. It had a good cinema score. It had good audience reception. So good critical reception, which kind of amazes me too that critics got behind it. That kind of, you just, even you haven't seen it. Knowing yeah. if, it, if it's a Deadpool movie, you could kind of expect critics to be annoyed with it, I guess. But, yeah. But I think that shows you just, again... I think movies with heart and passion kind of cross all boundaries, and this is a movie with heart and passion, and that's good, because I think we just got off a year where there were some very good superhero movies, but overall it kind of felt like we were in factory mode. Yeah, like it felt like we were sort of in a weird transitionary phase or something where... Yeah. Yeah, where, like you said, factory mode where people were sort of like making move, superhero movies out of obligation to keep the train moving and not necessarily because, oh, we have something to prove, because yeah. Marvel like... Proved everything they needed to prove with the Avengers. Yeah, and Avengers 2 is fine. Yeah. Ant-Man is good. Yeah. You know, all these things. But but this is this is more than that. Because this is really someone going out on a limb for this movie. And I love that. So. Cool. Yeah. Fun fact. The director, I, I learned this today. The director, this is a first time director. So actually one of the mini records Deadpool set is this is the highest grossing opening for a movie by a first time director. Huh. And his name's Tim Miller. He's, he's a visual effects guy. And I just learned he worked on stuff like Mass Effect 2, I oh. guess, in visual effects departments. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So he's worked on games and movies. He's done, like, opening credit sequences for movies, too. So, anyway. And that's cool. Because, again, oftentimes when you get a first-time director for a superhero movie, it doesn't work. So, yeah, this is good. Anyway, um, that's Deadpool. I had fun with it. A lot of other people did, too, clearly. So, Sean, what have you been up to? Yeah, so I guess there's, there's two things I want to talk about. First, follow up on The Witness a little bit. We Status reviewed it update. last week. Yeah. I mean, as much as, like, I, the review is... I don't know. It's we hard gave to, impressions? Yes, we gave impressions. But I feel like... Cause, so now, for people, like, following up on the conversation we had last week, I have... I slogged through the, the marsh area, and I got the trophy, so I know it's not called the swamp. It is called the marsh. And so I beat that. And the marsh area... Again, it's a area where you have to solve all these puzzles involving Tetris pieces. And it was like, and what I didn't realize, or like obviously I didn't like know when we were recording the podcast last time, was that I was like right on the verge of solving what is easily the hardest puzzle in that area, which comes halfway through. And once you get past there, they introduce two other concepts that are really easy to solve and don't make them complicated. And then like the last puzzle in the area is one of the easiest puzzles in the area, disregarding the tutorials. 
and then you'd like go through. So it's like I, it took me like an hour to finish this one puzzle I was working on, and it's just as soon as I finished that, I cleared the rest of the area, which is like thirty more puzzles in like ten minutes, and like it was like this. This was weird. I don't know why it got so hard. It gets so hard in the middle. Then once you clear that middle hump, it's as easy as any of the other areas. It's not like especially difficult anymore. So I cleared that, got through the, the marsh, said goodbye to the marsh, said fuck you to Tetris puzzles because those suck. Then I beat, there's like a uh, like treehouse kind of area that I beat. And I finished that and that introduces this concept with these sort of like circles that you have to pair up in different ways with your lines. And finished that puzzle set in like an hour and had fun with that. And then that was the, then I realized I had finished all of these sort of set areas that introduced uh, unique puzzle concepts in the game. And then from there on, I had two things left to finish, basically, which was the uh, solving the town, which is basically all these different concepts from the different areas sort of put together and sort of in different weird ways. And then the final area, which is also like that. So as soon as I started like getting a bit into the town puzzles, and I was like, eh, I'm not sort of feeling there, these. I'm just going to skip this in because I can go right to the end. I don't have to solve this because I've solved enough of the rest of the content in the game. I can go to the last area. So then I went to the last area and getting, got into there, started doing a couple more puzzles. Like, I'm not really feeling this either and went back to the town. And it, I did that for like two hours maybe and then realized that I think I'm just going to put the game down at this point because... For me, what was really fun about The Witness was not actually solving the puzzles. It was about deducing the systems behind how the puzzles work. And, like, because, again, with, we talked about this in uh, last week. The game explains absolutely nothing to you. It just sort of presents visual information to you. And you are supposed to take that and sort of experiment with it in kind of a scientific method way. And use that to de deduce the rules that, and the systems that govern this kind of puzzle. I found that process really fascinating and completely unlike any puzzle game I've ever seen before because most other puzzle games, like Portal tells you basically, hey, this is what you can do. Like you can make these portals. Like it shows you more or less explicitly and sometimes tells you this is what you can do. It'll say like, hey, pull the right trigger and all this stuff. And The Witness doesn't do that. And so that was really fun. But the actual process of solving those puzzles, especially when they get more difficult and are just going to take like, like, I look at a puzzle panel now, and I'm like, well, this is just going to take me 15 minutes to solve. And then I'm going to unlock this puzzle, and that's probably going to take me about 20 minutes to solve. And then I'm going to unlock this puzzle, that'll be another 20 minutes. And so it's like, I just look at these puzzles, and I just see, like, this is just me bump butting my head against this puzzle for a certain amount of time till I see the solution and, like, have worked through enough different configurations on how one might solve this puzzle in my head to see the one path that you can solve it. And that's not... It's like, it's fun, but it's nowhere near as fun as the game was for me before when I was just, like, learning the systems. And them complicating the systems and just making it harder to solve puzzles that you fundamentally know how to solve. You just need to go through the process. That's not that interesting. And I found that, I didn't realize that until I hit that point of the game, but that, that was what I really, really enjoyed about it. And so it's a weird, it's a really weird sensation. And it's still a game that I would recommend because I think it's really fascinating. And it, like I said, it does something that no other games do. But it is one where, like, I don't even know how you could, like, end a game like that and, like, have it end well based on what I enjoyed about it. Because it's, like, it kind of, what I enjoyed almost defies the concept of ending. It's, like, because what I enjoyed about it was all about the process of beginning a new set of puzzles and not about the, the, the process of actually finishing them, you know? Yeah, other than having, like, a final area that just had a harder puzzle type that was still new... I, it's the same. I can't imagine what you would do. Yeah, because it's it's completely logical that, like, the last area is, hey, like, you've seen these puzzle types before, but these are just harder versions of them and, like, different little twists on them. It's like, that's what the, like, logically, that's what the last area of that game should be, and it is basically what it is. But, like, it's like, I could, I know I could solve all these puzzles, and I think it's the fact that I know that I can just solve them, it's just going to take me a certain amount of time, it means it's in no way interesting to me yeah. to solve them at all. It was like the mystery of not even knowing, of like looking at this fucking Tetris puzzle and being like, what the fuck does this mean? How do you, what are these puzzles? Or looking at like a puzzle panel that's completely blank, and it's like, what am I supposed to do? And having to sort of like look around the environment or something, and like look at things from different perspectives, it's... When you know it's like, oh, I know how these Tetris puzzle pieces work. I'm just going to have to do this like 500 times in my head before I like clicks into like, oh, if I put that there, then I then this whole arrangement works in such a way that I can finish the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the witness. 
Jonathan, do you? I'm curious about like your plans on the witness and how you. Yeah, I. It's kind of funny. You ever get in a mode where you're looking for the right game to play, but you don't know what it is, and you kind of yeah. just jump around. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely had those times. And it happens to me most when I finish like a big game, and I rolled off The Witcher Three a couple weeks ago. Right. And then I played Gravity Rush, which was great, and it's like you know I think I spent maybe 20 hours in it, no more than that. But that was kind of a good thing to get off on um, because it was that sounded wrong. Yeah. Anyway, hey, to, if you what if to you're into off, is I what do, you're into. I, no. If you want to get off on Gravity Rush, <laughs> I, I mean at, it's got a really great art style. Like, I meant roll off too. Okay. But anyway, so I did that, and then I was kind of in the same. I was like, I need, I wanted something kind of meaty, you know. And yeah. the witness, I wasn't really feeling it. Like, I, I think. I don't want to say The Witness isn't for me. I just don't know if it's for me at this moment because I think you right. need to be in a very specific mindset for that game to work. That's very true. Um, so I, look, I will, like, definitely before like we make top ten lists and stuff at the end of the year, I will play as much of The Witness as I can. I'm just not feeling it right at the moment. Yeah. I tried that. I've tried Witcher 3 Hearts of Stone and I realized I think I just need a little more time away from The Witcher 3 before yeah. I can fully appreciate this. Yeah, because it, it had been like a couple of months since yeah. I finished it. When it's I really good. I want to say, like, I've, I've played... a. Like the first mission, some of that stuff. I'm I'm in that, and the writing scream. Like I can tell I'm going to enjoy this story. I just want to take a little time off. Yeah. So I'm gonna do that, and then, um, so I had this on my Wii U, and I hadn't played it yet. Uh, the Metroid Zero Mission, which I mentioned the other week, that they finally released that on Virtual Console here. It's a Game Boy Advance game that I've wanted to play for a while because I've been working my way through the Metroid series, and this one is. It's one of the harder Game Boy Advance games. It's not hard to get. It's just it's a little on the pricey side if I were to buy it and then like play it on my SP, which I love my SP. We have gone past the point where that screen size is normal and it's hard to go back to it. Yeah. So anyway, um, but I love the Wii U Virtual Console for all their Game Boy Advance stuff and whatnot. So I finally over, I think I played, took about two days and I played Metroid Zero Mission. It's a short game, but I, and I know this is an old game I'm going to praise here. I just... Yeah. I was off such a contact high finishing that game yesterday. I had to talk about it a little bit. That is a fucking phenomenal game. And if you own a Wii U, or I guess a Game Boy Advance, and you like Metroid and you've never encountered that one, it's fucking amazing. It's basically a remake of Metroid 1, but it's so much more than that. Hmm. And just like in the basic, the actual remake section of Metroid 1, it is more than that because it has... More things from like Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion thrown in there. You know, the the clamber ability that was introduced in Metroid Fusion is in there. So Samus can like grab onto edges. It's got like the space jump and things like that from Super Metroid that were not in the original NES Metroid. So it's really cool on that level. And then when the game should end, it doesn't. And I won't spoil that because for like, you know, 10 years I've been hearing... When the game should end, it doesn't, and I'm not going to spoil that. So I'm not going to ruin that tradition. Okay. Just that the last, like, half or third of that game is fucking incredible. And one of the coolest things Nintendo has ever done. I think that is... I know this is years later after the Game Boy Advance has been a thing. That is probably the best Game Boy Advance game I've ever played. And I loved my Game Boy Advance in the day. I've played many Game Boy Advance games. That is yeah. a fucking phenomenal game. Easily the best looking on that system, too. Because that's a game you blow it up for the TV... You don't miss a beat. It looks like a Super NES game or better. Like, it is beautiful. Like, there are very few, you know, pixel art-based games I've ever seen that are that gorgeous. Just the amount of detail in every pixel of that fucking thing. And, you know, you can... And I realized at the end, when you beat the game, you actually unlock original NES Metroid. Oh, I have that nice. on my Wii U twice now. Because I have the just right. NES version, which I think I got for free through Club Nintendo. So I have that there. And I can just go into Zero Vision and play it, and it looks a little better. So, I think that's kind of funny. Nice. If that's in there too. But that is a phenomenal game. One of the best things Nintendo has ever done. Right up there with... I don't know if I could choose my favorite Metroid game. I default to Metroid Prime. Right. But I think Metroid Prime, Super Metroid, and Zero Mission are kind of just all on top. And you could pick it, I, any of those and I would say that those are good choices. But anyway. Is there any one of those main Metroid games that you haven't done? I'm I, the last. I'm working my way through Fusion now. Fusion okay, is a game yeah. I've started a couple times. And that, that was also Game Boy Advance, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, and it was before Zero Mission. And I will say, I don't love Metroid Fusion. I think it's got some really good elements, and like the art style is great, the controls are great. It laid the groundwork for Zero Mission in a lot of ways. It's very linear, and I think it's mm -hmm. a little too handholdy. And it's kind of funny because that Metroid Fusion and Metroid Prime came out on the same day, and it was like mm -hmm. ten years since Super Metroid. 
So there had been this big gap, and then the Nintendo released a 3D game and a more traditional 2D game. And it's weird, I think the 3D one is way more faithful to the spirit of Metroid than Fusion is, even though Fusion looks more like Super Metroid. Yeah. So that's kind of funny. But no, I mean, it's still a good game. I mean, we're talking by Metroid standards, which is a really high bar. Like, other than, like, Other M, they've never released a Metroid game that people were like, eh, you know? People are very enthusiastic about yeah. Metroid games. Are you going to tackle Other M? Is yes. that where this, that's where this road leads? The, it will. I, now, and I also have not played Metroid Prime 3. So once oh, I'm done okay. with Fusion, I have to play that, and then... The only really ones, like, I guess I can say I've played original Metroid now because I've played Zero Mission. Um, and I've definitely played a lot of the NES game, but I'm, that's not a game I'm ever going to finish. It's just yeah, too old. It's kind of like trying to play the original Legend of Zelda. Yeah. And it's like, it's, you say it to yourself, it's like, that sounds like that would be pretty fun. Like, this, it's like, I know this game has aged poorly. Like, it's really old. And then you play, you're like, fuck, man, I'm not going to finish this game. Well, it's, t- it's like you can enjoy it completely on the level that of, like, history and being, yeah. like, as a research thing. But if you just want to play a game, you really, like, there's no map in original Metroid. And that is so defining to that series. And then I have Metroid 2 on my 3DS Virtual Console. And I might try that at some point. That's another one that's hard to go back to. So Metroid, is that an original Game Boy game? Is that what they did with Metroid? Yeah. Fuck. I don't even know why I know that. It went Metroid, Metroid 2, Return of Samus on Game Boy, and then Super Metroid. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, the series starts at Super Metroid. Right, yeah. That game is such a defining masterwork. That's kind of... It's not the first one, but it's kind of the, the, the first one that really matters. Yeah. And you can go back. That that one is just perfect. And, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of the mainline ones. And then I will try Other M at some point. It's not like a priority, like we'll put, you know, Persona 5 aside for it no. or something. But I, I'm just... I'm fascinated by that game. Yeah, because people fucking hate that game. And, and here's like, the, reading why they hate that game, it seems like they have very good reasons for hating that game. And here's the thing. That is not a game that's hard to find. You can get nope. that for like five bucks used. Yeah, like you can find that like in like the gutter on the side of the road, <laughs> man. Like, like I mean, people really fight. Like, because people hate Other M in a way that it's like destroys the franchise and like the characters for them in terms of like how poorly it treats them. It's not just that it's a bad game. It's yeah. like for them, it's like it's a disrespectful game to Metroid. Well, and it's because, I mean, that one, they had just rolled off the Metroid Prime trilogy, which is... There's not many more gaming trilogies you can name that are more respected than that. Yeah, I mean, and particularly, beloved. like, the original Metroid Prime is one of the greatest games ever made. Like, yes. that's... It's on those lists, like, yeah. everywhere. Yeah, and Metroid Prime, I should mention, I, I did the exact same thing to myself with Metroid Prime I did with Mass Effect the first time I tried playing Mass Effect, where I played one, loved it, rolled right into two, loved it, finished it, started three, hit a wall, and, like, I've played too much Metroid Prime. Yeah. And I did that with Mass Effect also, and so I will go back. I'm not going to have to replay Metroid Prime 1 and 2, because it's not like the stories are that in-depth. But I, I just needed to take a break, and then other things came up, and it's been almost a year. But I will go play three. I'm excited. And people like that one. I, it's, it's, I don't think it's anyone's favorite. No. But it's no one's least favorite. So, I mean, so with, like, the, I've always found the Metroid Prime franchise kind of strange, because everyone acknowledges that the original game is one of the best ever made. And yeah. then like everyone seems to really like the other ones, but nobody ever really talks about Metroid Prime 2 or Metroid Prime 3. Like They, they kind of just like faded into the background where it's like Metroid Prime 1 comes up all the time in conversation. Yes. Well, and I think when you play them it's clear why because it's just rare that the what is effectively the first game in a series and I know Metroid Prime is part of a larger series but it is the first in that yeah. specific series. It's rare that I think a developer gets it that right the first time out. Like Mass Effect, it's easy to know why people talk about 2 and 3 because 1 is a mess in a lot of ways. Yes, yeah. It's a great game, but it is messy, and I we can all acknowledge that. Yeah. Or it's like Uncharted 1 versus Uncharted 2. Yes. It's like Uncharted 1 is a good game. Uncharted 2 is a, an amazing game. But if Uncharted 1 was as good as 2, and then 2 was just kind of at that same level or yeah. lower, you wouldn't talk about 2. It's why yeah. people don't talk about Uncharted 3 as much. Yeah. Because I, they I, should. Well, and I know there are people who like Uncharted 3 more and yes, think it's their like favorite. Me. But even you can recognize, like, if you were writing a history book, you would talk about two more. Well, yeah, of course, because yeah. it's the one that made all the big changes. But then I would be like, hey, that boat part in Uncharted 3 is fucking rad, man. Yeah. So that's you fall what out of a, of a fucking plane in Uncharted yeah. 3 over the desert, and then you have to walk through the desert. It's fucking cool. And I should say, I've learned my lesson with gaming trilogies, because I have that Uncharted set. I played one. I'm waiting for a free moment, then I'll play two, and then I'm going to wait again and play three. And I've got all the way until, like, the end of April for yeah. four. So I'm, like, I'm spacing them out for myself. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. Because, especially those kind of games would get repetitive if you just played them a bunch. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, I'm excited to go back to it. And I will say, I think Metroid Prime 2 is fantastic. It's got a lot of amazing stuff. 
interesting kind of things other games really haven't done in that way because it's got a light world dark world system which obviously is borrowed from Zelda yeah but to see that done in 3D the way they do it I've never seen anything like that and I think my biggest knock against Metroid Prime 2 is I think it's too long like it's a game that just it's rare you say that about a game but yeah. it is a little too long and that's it becomes a little bit of a slog at a certain point but it's fascinating I love the story it tells it's a real masterwork of of telling a story in a minimalist way and I love that about it so it's great but it is it's like it doesn't do anything that elevates it again above the first one so you have to talk about the first one if you're going to reference them yeah so yeah yeah I was just I've always been curious about that because I've only I've never even beaten Metroid Prime 1 by depth I played it quite a bit on the GameCube yeah. back back in the day but I've never touched the other ones at all yeah they're great but yeah. interesting so yeah um yeah, there's one other there's one other game I wanted to talk about that I usually don't do this, but I was my brother uh, was here the other day and I was talking to him about this where like I've over the past couple of months I've been playing some phone games here and there like out of kind of curiosity and things that I've heard about and like there's some of them that are pretty good I, in particular I would really recommend this game called Terra Battle on the phone it's it's really it's a sort of it's a very interesting kind of strategy game that's very sort of minimalist and it's about you sort of like placing your characters and flanking other enemies. It's, I'm not going to explain everything about it because I haven't played it a lot recently, but it's a lot of fun. But I want to talk about one game in particular because I've been having fun playing it, but it's the most, like, sort of stark example I've seen of, of like, where the, the really predatory sort of monetary design of mobile games have come into play in a way that is, like, really turning me off. It's a game called... It's, this, it's a Star Wars game, and it's called, I think, Galaxy of Heroes. Yeah, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. And if you were paying really close attention uh, last E3, EA had like five seconds on screen. of like, hey, Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, here's some character models. And it's like, then that game came out, I think, a couple of months ago. And I heard some good stuff about it. And I was like, curious. And I was kind of in a Star Wars-y mood. And so I was playing it here and there. And it's it's basically a turn-based uh, strategy game. Well, not, not strategy game. It's more like turn-based combat, almost like Final Fantasy style in a way where you uh, unlock these different characters that are all characters like I have a Chewbacca and there's some like Clone Wars characters and stuff like that. You And then there's a bunch of generic characters while like I have a Snow Trooper and a Clone Sergeant and stuff like that. And you basically construct these different teams of these different characters and take them through these different missions. And they're basically just three series of different turn-based battles where all your characters have like, oh, my Jedi Consular has heal ability, my Chewbacca has a taunt, and so like, I'll use my Chewbacca to taunt and people will shoot him, and my Consular can use heal to heal all my guys, and it's very simple turn-based strategy. But it's really well made, like, for what it is for a, like, little time killer of like, hey, I've got like five to ten minutes that I just need to, like, do this here, and I've got my phone. It's an engaging little thing to do. The part that's really frustrating is then every once in a while, it sort of will pop up, and you'll like, I, it was just like, it was actually, it was just yesterday, because this is when I was talking to my brother. And I beat a couple of missions, and I leveled up, and when I leveled up, it popped up this thing, like a link, and it was like, click me to, I clicked the link, and it was, went to the in-game store, because apparently I unlocked this limited time offer, that I have five days and five hours left on this limited time offer, for the Force Awakens Ultimate Bundle, where I get... So I'm just going to say what you get from this. And keep in mind, there are like 50, 60 maybe characters in this game. And the characters are not like that amazing. Like it's, they're fine, but there's like basically five different types of characters and all of them kind of fit in those types. So it's not like, oh, I got a Darth Vader. This is the most amazing thing ever that I have this Darth Vader character. He's a little bit better than other characters and has a like one unique move. And that's basically it. So what you get out of this drop is you get a Kylo Ren character, a Finn character, 50 Poe Dameron shards, which if you collect shards and you get enough shards, you unlock the character that the shard represents. So I think, I think Poe is like, he's a, he's like an 80 shard character. So I would need to get more shards. And then you can also, you get some captain, you can get some captain phasma shards out of it as well. And then you get 43 star training droids that you can use to level people up. And then you get 300,000 credits of in-game money, which is completely worthless because I've never needed to do anything to get money and I have 171,000 credits and I don't even know what you spend credits on. I assume I just spend them randomly when I'm doing stuff and I don't notice. So that's what you get. You basically get two characters and progress to get in, and a chance to get progress to two other characters and then you get some like basically worthless other drops. Jonathan, how much money do you think this costs? 
So well, off the top of your head. Based on the way you're setting it up, it's got to be higher than expected. Thirty nine ninety nine. This, Jonathan, you can buy this for the great value for this limited time offer for $99.99. Jesus, what the hell? I thought I was going too high. This is a hundred fucking dollars. A hundred dollars. Limited time offer. Best deal, Jonathan. A hundred dollars for two characters. Two fucking characters. So a character in this game is worth $50? Is that how the other ones are priced? I mean, not really, because like I, it's so hard to do. Try to do the conversion off the top of your head, but there's a pack that you can buy for in-game gems that you can earn. That I've played this game for like two weeks now, and I'm like halfway to getting one of these through in-game efforts. It's just like getting really obnoxious that it's taking that long. It's like I'm gonna try to thumb through to where you can buy the gems and see how much. So God. okay, it takes it costs about twenty dollars to get a pack that guarantees you a character and will give you progress towards unlocking other characters. It's like and it's such a fucking shame because this game is so much fun to play. I've been really enjoying it, and but like the grind you hit once you play like probably three hours total of the game, which you like are going to have to spread out over like a fair like a week or something because yeah, of, like all the free to play mechanics. Like, once you hit that bump where it's like, oh god, now, like, you're not just handing me characters anymore. Now I'm really having to hit the grind. And then you pop up with this fucking bundle offer for a hundred dollars for this, like, kind of okay turn-based battle game that has a Star Wars skin on it. Like, go fuck yourself. And you don't even get all the Force Awakens characters. You get Finn and Kylo Ren. Yeah, you don't get Rey, because Rey is in the game. Okay, she is in the game. She is in the game. Captain Phasma is in the game. Although none of them have the lightsaber. Other than Kylo Ren obviously does, but Finn and Rey don't have lightsabers. Because I think that that pack, like, those characters were available before the movie came out, so they didn't want to be like, oh, hey, they get lightsabers in this movie. Spoilers. But yeah, it's... Fucking, it's ridiculous. It's so insane. That's ludicrous. The gall to even ask me. A hundred dollars, like... I paid $60 for Fallout 4. I played $40 for The Witness. Like, th- those games have their problems. They are more than worth the money. Yes. It's like, this game is like... Like, if I... I would pay a total of $10 if they re- like made this game to like cut out all the bullshit grind and make it so like there's a reasonable ramp to unlocking characters naturally through play and you just yanked out all the free-to-play bullshit... I would pay like ten dollars max, and I would be like, eh, "That seems like a fair price for like all the access to all these characters." A hundred dollars! It's insane. Yeah, the mobile games I play pretty much just amount to. I'm looking right because I was just curious. Hearthstone, yeah. Sudoku, which is not like a. It's the version of Sudoku I play. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, have you ever heard of Alto's Adventure? No, I haven't. That's a great one. You should get that one. It's a free runner. But it's like, it's as if the people who made Journey made a free runner. Oh, it's cool. gorgeous, and it's really kind of evocative, and it's a really fun free run. It doesn't feel kind of bullshitty like Temple Run or something. So I really like that one. But that's kind of it. I have some other ones on here. I have Knights of the Old Republic on my phone, because <laughs> my brother bought it. Um, but I haven't, I, I don't think I'm going to play it that way. <laughs> yeah. But I have it. I have the original Final Fantasy. But, but yeah, like, it's something where it's so weird where I feel like, because this obviously, like that for that free to play, like microtransaction stuff has been going on for a, like years now in the mobile phone space, in the mobile game space, and I've never really sort of like dipped into it because every time I kind of looked at something, the games were always terrible. Yes. But like the past year or two or so, there have been like some of these games that have come out that I'm like, this is a really good game. Like that Terra Battle, that's a really good fucking game. And the, but you in that game as well, you hit this point where it's like. I, I don't even know how I could possibly unlock characters without spending money. And but this is how they get you, and this yeah. is how this is a market, is that those aren't aimed at you, educated gamer. They're no. aimed at, you know, Joe Schmo, who doesn't play games and thinks this is what it is. And has and too much disposable income. and Too much yeah. disposable income, and then hits the $99 thing and thinks, well, I don't have a point of comparison, yeah. so whatever, that's what they're asking. I might as well do it. Now, that's probably overkill, but, like, yeah. just the smaller things of, like, Hearthstone is a better example, maybe, of just buying the packs and thinking, 
Yeah, yeah that's fine. You know, whatever. But like, but... The, I think in Hearthstone that is fine. Like, that is because yes. it's not that much thing. money, and it's like it's a fair and like you get some cards, and it's it's like fairly equivalent to what like Magic the Gathering does. Because if it's you're like, into it, it's worth it. Yeah, there are some games that do do it fine, and Hearthstone's a really good example of one that like you never feel like you are impeded because you're not spending money. You never yeah. feel like oh, there's I'm not gaining anything by not spending money, and or like oh, you like. You fooled me because I spent like three hours having fun with this game and not having to like be enticed in any way to spend money. And then all of a sudden I hit this wall where it's like, oh man, I'm not getting experience as fast as I was before. It's like, I'm starting to run out of like this energy or like, man, like I just realized there are like 500 different things that I could buy and like 5 billion different currencies and stuff. I'm still unlocking different forms of currency in the Star Wars game. Free, free play, free to play is one of the many cancers on the gaming industry at the moment yeah it's just it's such a shame because the the core design of the games is it's getting good enough that it's making me mad that's like why is this actually really like terror battles like this really interesting unique strategy game that's like would not be possible on an interface not that's an iphone because it uses the touch screen it's so important how that game plays it's like that's just, this is an amazing little game. It's like, if I played this game, like, seven years ago or so, I guess it'd be long, like, ten years ago, I thought this would be, like, one of the best games I'd ever played. It's like, the, how the artwork is gorgeous, the music is great, the combat's really fascinating and unique, but then, I'm like, every time I try to play it now, I just get really frustrated because I haven't, like, been able to get a new character in that game for, like, three months without, like... With just like playing the game normally, where it's, yeah. at early on it's like you were getting f- free characters or like earning characters through energy and stuff really easily, and it's like, fuck. The whole like one like really key part of these games is the progression loop because every that's like one of the big things about games since Call of Duty Four was figuring out how these like RPG like progression loops can work in like very different kinds of games and sort of honing that to enhance the experience and it's being like weaponized by these games. To seduce you and to psychologically manipulate you to to purchase stuff, but it's like attached to this thing that is an integral part of making the game fun long term, and it's so infuriating for someone who just wants to enjoy the game and would be like, I would easily, I would pay fifteen dollars for Terra Battle, like if I could just buy Terra Battle for fifteen bucks and you just made a like reasonable progression curve like any other video game, that would be fine. But no, there's no way to do that. There's no world in which I can spend $15 and get that experience with this game. Because if I do spend $15, it's just going to make it worse for myself when I hit that wall again and I need to pay more money for more characters. Yeah. It's infuriating. Well, it's predatory and it's like gambling at a certain point. And it's one of those things where it is legal and you're not sure why. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I reiterate, a hundred fucking dollars. Go fuck yourself, EA. God damn it. You made a good game. Don't shoot it in the foot. I'm sure they're making so much money off of it, though. I'm pretty sure that's the logo of EA at this point, yeah. right? EA, you made a good game. Don't, don't fuck shoot, with you. Yeah, don't, don't shoot yourself in the foot. That's their motto. No, I, uh, one update also. All right. My brother, I finally got him to play The Witcher 3. Okay. On his fancy new computer, 4K, all that shit. And he's gotten obsessed with it, so that's nice. Great. I'm glad to see he was. I a little worried, but like the other night, it was hilarious. I had a t- conversation with him, and I said... Because a few nights before I had this conversation, I asked him where he was, and he said, I'm at the Bloody Bear, and I'm like, oh, already, that's awesome, you're at the Bloody Bear, and that's a really good part of the game. And he's like, yeah, it's really good. I just buried the fetus. And I'm like, yeah, it's fucked up, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, so. That's a great, if you just, like, have no idea what the Witcher is. Yeah. <laughs> hearing that. Yeah, no, that is a really good part of the game, though. You're right. No, but I was talking to him, and he said, I just did all the stuff with Kira Metz, a yeah. good part of the game. I said, and now I'm going to meet these witches. I haven't heard about Anna or the Bloody Bear in a while, though. And I had to, like, keep a straight face and right. be like. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, have fun with the witches. You know? <laughs> yeah. so that's anyway. He had no idea, um, but anyway. So and then I told him, uh, it's like so. You, and he said, "Am I almost done with Velen?" And I'm like, "Yeah, you're almost done with Velen. That's less than a quarter of the game." Yeah. Just so you know. And he's like, "What?" He's like, "I gotta get going here. And I feel like I'm going slow." And I'm like, "Take your time. It's fine." Yeah. But yeah, I. I forgot that too because Velen is such a me- that could be its own game. Yeah. It's such a meaty part of it, and that is a sliver of the overall game yeah yeah your perspective of that game definitely really changes once you get out of Velen and you realize oh yeah like that's that whole story was like one little like self-contained piece of this much larger thing yeah if you I split the game know. into acts it's basically one fifth of the game I yeah mean, yeah so anyway great game though uh news a couple of little quick pieces of news yeah here's something we had not covered that cbs last year 
announced that they were planning to make a new Star Trek TV series. Yes. And exciting for a couple reasons, because I think Star Trek, just historically, obviously, it is a TV series. It works better that way than in yeah. movies. Kind of like X-Files. Yes, so just, exactly. Yeah, so it's something like that, where X-Files, its movies aren't bad or anything, but they're not the height of the series. And no. Other than, like, Wrath of Khan and Star Trek VI, there's a couple of good ones, but none of them are, like, the best things in the series. Yeah. I would still point to episodes. Even maybe Wrath of Khan would go with the best episodes. Yeah, but, but that's also like, it's such a different thing. Than it's also the like, sequel to an episode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, but so they're making a new st- series. It's exciting. It's also a little worrying because CBS had announced Alex Kurtzman from the movies and from Amazing Spider-Man 2 for yeah. it, she should ever forever be branded. Um, she didn't have worth- to get that tattooed on yeah. his forehead. I wrote Amazing it's, Spider-Man 2. It's like in Inglorious Bastards when they carve the Nazi yeah. symbols, the swastikas into their foreheads. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I don't really no, support yeah, that. That's, but no, anyway, yeah. Um, yeah, so he would be associated with it. And that the way they would be doing it is they would air the premiere on CBS and then the rest of the show would go out on their streaming platform, CBS All Access, which is like their a la carte service. And so it was, all of that was kind of like, well, this sounds like it's going to be a mess. Yeah. And then this week they announced they have signed Brian Fuller as the showrunner of the new Star Trek. And if you don't know why Brian Fuller, who Brian Fuller is, let me tell you why you should be excited. Okay, Tom. He's made a bunch of great shows. I have not seen all of them, but I know people, like his first show ever was this show called Wonderfalls. Short-lived, but people love that show. I think he made Pushing Daisies. People love yeah. that show. And most recently he made Hannibal which I and many others would point to as one of the best modern American TV series and definitely evidence of a guy who can take an old, stale piece of property yeah. and make it new and exciting. Brian Fuller also got his start on Deep Space Nine, later wrote for Voyager, has history with Star Trek. Yeah. He is currently producing the upcoming Stars adaptation of Neil Gaiman's American Gods. Oh, cool. Which makes me question, is that going to be a miniseries then? Because obviously he Probably. can't work on both. Yeah, I mean, it would... It would only really make sense as a miniseries because it's yeah. a single novel. And you never know with TV these days the way they like to stretch things that's out. True. But I hope it's a miniseries because, as you say, it's one novel. But anyway, so after he's done with American Gods, he will be making the Star Trek show. There is literally no one they can announce who would make me more excited for this. Maybe like a Joss Whedon type if he wanted to c- come out of his shell and make yeah. a Star Trek show. But I don't think he'd want to do that. And I don't know if that's... Still, I don't think he's as good as the, for this as Brian Fuller would be. Brian Fuller just clearly, if you know his work, is the right guy for this. And now we have a new, presumably good Star Trek show to work on. That's exciting. Yeah. Has this been... When was in? When did Enterprise End? Like finish? 2004, yeah. 2005? Yes, yeah, it's been a long fucking time yeah. since Star Trek was on TV. It's kind of surprising, honestly, that they haven't made another... I mean, Enterprise was not very good. But, but it, it, it fizzled out in the ratings, yeah. which is why it happened. And Yeah, so... But no, I'm really excited, and I think... You know, I don't love the whole, you have to go buy CBS All Access for it, but yeah. maybe they'll put up an iTunes pass and I can just pay for it that way. Either way, I will watch it, and it's exciting. It's so good to know we're going to have new, good Star Trek in the world. And as uh, Alan Sepinwall, the TV critic for HitFix, was pointing out in a video he did, Brian Fuller has a reputation such that he would not sign on to this if he didn't have, like, control over it. Right. So you can trust also it's going to be his show, not... He's like a figurehead or something. So Have they talked at all if this is going to like get involved in like the continuity from the movies or No. Because like, it seems like that's such a weird because obviously like they're they're making that Star Trek three movie because that like trailer was not that long ago. Yeah. But, so it's like I'm curious if they're going to just it'll be like parallel and like be set in the same timeline as the movies and just be like a different crew on a different ship, or if like they say like fuck it, it's the original timeline again, because that's always possible. Like there's no reason why you can't set something else in the original timeline. I just don't know if they'd be afraid to. Yeah, I and I mean, at the end of the day, the great thing about Star Trek is all you need is a ship, a captain, a crew, and some alien worlds. Yeah. It's like what you were talking about with X-Files or Doctor Who. You just need the basic ingredients and you can tell whatever story you want to tell. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about all this other shit. And I don't think Brian Fuller is the kind of guy who cares much about continuity. So we'll see. If, even if the mandate is set it in the current movie timeline, okay, that might not even matter. Like, yeah, this, I mean, yeah. It, but it could if they like try yes. to like shove a lot of movie stuff in there. It's also possible he could make way better use of that altered timeline than the movies have. That's true. Because my biggest complaint about the movies is like, I love that first J.J. Abrams movie. 
in retrospect, it feels like a great two-hour pilot to a TV series. Yeah. Like, it shouldn't be the start of a movie series, and I think Into Darkness really proved that, which is Star Trek is a TV show. It's smaller, bite-sized stories, and they tried to go for a big, bigger scale for the sequel, and that's just not what Star Trek is. Yeah. And it really kind of sunk that movie for me. And, yeah, so we'll see with Star Trek Beyond... But I'm much more excited for this. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Like like you said, Star Trek is a TV show, first and foremost. Yeah. It's like, it's it's what it should be. And it's really cool that they're bringing that back. Like I said, it's been a long fucking time since they've had a new Star Trek TV show. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, maybe also being on the streaming surface will just give more creative freedom automatically because it's not on TV with standards and practices. Yeah, that would be nice. Like, I'm sure it'll be still on brand for CBS. Like, it won't have sex and nudity and stuff. But it probably won't have to be as, like, formulaic or any of those things. Maybe it'll be, like, there'll be nudity, but it'll be, like, really bizarre aliens are nude. <laughs> in the way that, like, cartoons, like, you'd, like, have, like, destroy robots and have them shoot oil all over the place. Because it's not blood, it's just oil. Yeah. Like, like the pilot to Samurai Jack is the bloodiest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. He's just destroying robots from the future, and so they spew oil all over the place. So he's not dripping in blood, like, from, like, head to toe at the end of the episode. He's just dripping in oil. Nice so we can just work Samurai Jack reference in here. That's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting times. Jack is coming back. A lot of... Some stupid stuff is coming back. Again, I cite Fuller House. <laughs> just as a joke. But a lot of good stuff is coming back. Yes. So... Star Trek and Samurai point. Jack. Maybe they'll make the crossover. Finally. Finally. I just love that... that Hannibal could so easily have blacklisted Brian Fuller. Like, people would look at the weird Rorschach test lesbian sex scene in the middle of the third season and be like... Nope, he's not working on our network, and instead he's really in demand, and I yeah. love that. It's not how network TV should work, but it's working differently, and that's good. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, all right, speaking of things that are different, Batman v Superman, Dawn of right? Justice, yes. new trailer, the final trailer? The final trailer, that's what it said on YouTube. I thought the scene at the beginning was, was okay. Yeah, like, I at least I appreciate, because I feel like this movie was last week or like two weeks ago or something... I talked about like I, how shitty action scenes in superhero movies typically are. In particular, the Christopher Nolan Batman movies, just like they are so bad. But for like, if you're comparing what like the fantasy Batman action scene is, those movies do not deliver on that at all. Like they have good action in other ways, but like the the hand to hand fight scenes are terrible. And this was like, yeah, this is Batman fighting people. And if you haven't seen it, the the trailer. The last two minutes are just unintelligible. They're just yeah. music and sound and it was noise. But I've watched the first 30 seconds a couple times because it's a... It is honestly the best Batman action sequence I've ever seen in live action. Yes. That's a very low bar to clear. But it's the first... Like, I think the Dark Knight movies have some good, like, car chase kind of stuff. Like the scene in the middle of the Dark Knight where they're yeah. catching the Joker. But any time in those or the Tim Burton movies or whatever where it's Batman has to fight someone... It's not good. Yeah, because... it's like really stiff-necked and like big like punches and like in there's some like weird shaky cam in the yeah. Christopher Nolan ones as uh, well. The Bane fight is like the only really good one. Yeah, yeah, and, like the middle of that movie. Yeah, and uh, anyway, so but bat like and what I thought I liked about the Batman scene in this trailer is it looked like the Arkham Knight Batman yeah. going to town on guys like yes, that's Batman. That is recognizably Batman fighting. We've never seen that in a live action movie. Now I have one thing to be excited for for this movie. Yeah. Because that could be cool. I hadn't thought of that because we honestly hadn't seen it yet. Yeah. And I like that idea. What I'm worried about is that that's the only scene like that in that movie yeah. is because obviously, like, because you can only do that fight scene with him taking out a room full of dudes. The, like, the fight scene of Batman fighting Superman is not, can't be like that because yeah. that's not how Superman's powers work. It wouldn't make any sense, like, for him to, like, try to, like, dislocate Superman's shoulder or something. That's, like, that's... You're not going to get anywhere doing that, Batman. Yeah. So, and then the rest of the trailer, like I said, was just someone in marketing at WB has a vendetta against this movie and will not cut a good trailer for it. Yeah. I just, I thought it was poorly edited. I thought it was just a lot of moments we've pretty much seen already, but in a more incomprehensible format. And it's something where... It's kind of felt strange after the last trailer giving away the entire plot of the movie. This one felt like the people like making the trailers are like, oh shit, people didn't like that we gave away the entire third act of the movie in that last trailer. So we're just going to make this like, to have this one cool, well-edited sequence at the beginning and then just incomprehensible like flashes and lights and screaming at people and a little bit more than that one scene of Lex Luthor again going like, oh, uh, the insane. Okay, okay. Let me do a Lex... For, for, good thing, bad thing. Okay. Good thing, 
I still like everything we're seeing from Wonder Woman. Like, I don't know how it fits into the movie, but, like, that is more, like, that kind of looks cool, and I like that we're going to, I don't know. I, that I don't know. Okay. I found, like, I've watched the trailer, like, three times, and every time we got the shot where Wonder Woman, like, is standing completely still, and then all of a sudden, like, jumps or is flung, like, 50 miles an hour forward, like, yelling. I find that really funny every single time I see no, it. No, that's not the part I'm talking okay. about. That's awful. Okay, because it's just, it's like. It's a bad effect. It's, it's just, like, I, I don't know why I. I, maybe it's just me, but I've never, I've not seen anyone else talking online about finding that really funny. Every time I saw it, I laughed out loud. Because see, here's the thing: if it's that, just fucking hilarious. If that were in the trailer for a Wonder Woman movie, that wouldn't be the case, right? Maybe I don't, it might. I think it's just the timing and the effect and the yell okay. and like the fact that it's so obviously like there's like a something CG going on where it's like she's standing there and all of a sudden like there's not enough. Yeah. Prep and like the camera just all of a sudden like very digitally is like moving forward like really quickly is like it looks like all the like it looks like Zack Snyder like watched an anime and was like trying to like do an anime thing in his fight scene without realizing like you do realize that only works in anime because it's animated right like you can't like just put in this live action movie like the shot of like Wonder Woman with like no sense of physics or reality just going like Oh, I'm like shooting forward at 50 miles an hour from standing still. It looks fucking ridiculous. No, it looks stupid and it could just be a trailer thing. It's we'll hilarious. See. But anyway, I meant more like when she's a person and she's right, interacting yeah. with them. I think that could be fun to see anyway. But um, the bad thing, every line Lex Luthor has in these trailers makes no goddamn sense. Like his whole, the red capes are coming. Yeah. It's cool for a second, and they're like, well, wait, what does that mean? Yeah. I have no idea. Okay. That's weird. And then his line that we, we've heard parts of it before, but we got the full version of this trailer. He says, you know the oldest line in America, Senator? It's that power can be innocent. What does that mean? And who has ever said that ever in the history yeah. of America? Yeah. What is he talking about? I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah. Like, it's... Lex Luthor seems like he's not going to be a very good character in this movie, Jonathan. No. The the bigger thing was this trailer prompted a bit of a shitstorm when uh, Drew McQueenie from Hit Fix, who I've referenced before, he's one of my favorite film critics, and yes. he's very well connected, great writer, and he just report he was just talking about the trailer on a video, you know, the videos Hit Fix does where they talk about things, yes. and he just said, my sources have told me, you know, people inside Warner Brothers that Warner Brothers is worried about the movie. A lot of people are saying it's not very good. And Warner is preparing, if this does not go well, to restructure everything with their DC stuff. And they don't want Zack Snyder on Justice League anymore. They don't trust him anymore. And that's his. And Drew McWeeney knows what he's talking about. He has yeah. been doing this for a long time. And he has. if he says he has sources, he has sources. And just because he doesn't tell you his sources doesn't mean they're not real. That's what journalism is. Yeah. People on the internet don't get that about sources. You don't yeah. reveal your sources because then... Then they are not your sources, sources anymore, anymore, and you yeah. just like compromise this person's job. Yeah, yeah. that's why you don't do it anyway. Um, but then that sent off a shitstorm because people online are immature. But it's kind of funny. That's exactly kind of what I would have expected to hear. I mean, yeah, and it's it's weird. I mean, and this happens sometimes. Drew McQueenie noted that that was also some of the reaction from Mad Max. Warner Brothers was very scared of that movie before it came out. And luckily, all went well. Yeah. But anyway, so... But I doubt this is a visionary masterwork. It's not a George no, Miller yeah, movie. I'd be surprised if it was Mad Max Fury you wrote. Well, it won't be. There's nothing yeah. is Mad Max Fury wrote, including other George Miller movies. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, but yeah, I... It's kind of what I expected. Uh, the shitstorm is not unexpected. No, I but mean, it, it's, a, it's a comic book movie. I just... I like getting the confirmation that even Warner Brothers knows that their fucking plans are full of hubris. Yeah. <laughs> is it like... Oh, maybe we jumped the gun. Maybe, yeah. maybe just having Batman and Superman's names in the title of this movie doesn't automatically make it a really good movie. Who knew? And what Drew suggested in his video is that he said what he would expect is that if they have to restructure things, what they'll probably do is push Justice League back, and as soon as they can, make a Ben Affleck, Ben Affleck Batman movie because people are saying he's the one part of the movie that's really good. Is he's a really and good like Batman. based on that trailer, I can definitely see that. Yeah, I think. I, you know, again, I don't think it's a particularly high bar to clear. I think Michael Keaton is really good, but he was limited by certain things of the time. Yeah, and it's like, it's a very different, like, he's very good for that movie, but it's not like he's, like, the definitive Batman. No, I think if Ben Affleck is good, he could be the best live-action Batman. Yeah. And we'll see if the movie gives him room to be that, but... Although the one thing in that trailer that I'm still not really sold on is Jeremy Irons is Alfred. I no. still feel like it just doesn't fit at all. It to looks me. like he'll do a good job and he'll yeah. do some good, but it doesn't. It doesn't feel like Alfred to me. Yeah, it's just like it's, and maybe it is just like that thing about like some actors are like typecast in a certain way that it's like I like 
it's hard for me to look at Jeremy Irons and not think of him as being a villain because he's a villain in like most of the movies he's in. So it's like I can't hear his voice over the radio and not think like, boy, that sounds an awful lot like Scar from The Lion King because he's got such a distinctive voice and presence. I also, I don't think he's old enough to be Alfred. Like, Yeah, that's true. Especially if you have an older Batman. Like, uh, if you're going off the Frank Miller thing, Alfred's supposed to be, like, old and fucking decrepit and, like, at the end of his rope. Jeremy Irons is a, you know, sprightly 65 or something. Yeah. I don't... He could be older than that. He doesn't look older than that. Yeah. So... Like, like, he can still be in action movies and shit. Yeah, like, Michael Caine was kind of the perfect age for that Batman yeah. and everything. Yeah, and then, like, and that's the other thing with Jeremy Irons is, like, living up to Michael Caine's Alfred from yeah. those movies is, like, yes. that's a hard fucking job to yeah. take. Like, one of the things, the Christopher Nolan movies just got 100% perfect. Yes. They're Alfred. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Tough. But, yeah. I don't think that's a thing that will derail the movie. But No, it be no. It's just, like, a minor point. Like, he's pretty heavily featured yeah. at the beginning of that yes. trailer. And, like, it reminded me, like, oh, yeah, this is really weird. Like, I still... I see that, like, some people like him and, like, think this, like, oh, that's a cool direction to go with Alfred online. I was like... I just don't see it. Like, I, I really it. don't see it at all. But I am, I mean, that is, this is the one side of the movie I am legitimately excited to see is the new Batman and that side of things. Yeah, because I think Ben Affleck looks like he's going to do a good job. Yeah. Like, he seems like he's going to be fine. Yeah, and I'm really, I feel bad for Henry Cavill because I really do like his Superman and yeah, I like his good. performance. And you even, hating Man of Steel, liked him. Yeah, no, he's good. Like, yeah. without a doubt. He looks really stranded in every scene he's had in these trailers because he's had very a line of dialogue and it's always... Superman just looking like a dick. Like when at the end he's trying to punch Batman and he stopped and he looks, you know, all mad. And it's like, it's like he's not getting to play Superman. Yeah, like it's, if, I mean, it's the same thing we've been saying all along. They should have had a Man of Steel 2 before they tried to do this. Because all of these trailers look like trailers to Batman movies, not to Superman movies. Because, yeah. and it's Batman is headlined in the, the title. It's Batman v Superman. It's like I want Superman to pull like a Daffy Duck or something at the beginning of the movie and like change yeah. the title around. It's too bad. I, Superman is a weird thing for me where I think Superman is kind of the opposite of Batman where I honestly think they've cast Superman in live action well three times. Yes, yeah, I absolutely. really like Christopher Reeve. I really like Brandon Ruth. Whatever you say about Superman Returns, I thought he was a good yeah, Superman. Yeah, he's good. And I like Henry Cavill. And yet Superman as a franchise, other than the 1978 movie, which is really good, is very compromised every time. Yeah. I don't think any of them are awful. Like, I, I like Superman Returns okay. I mean... I, oh, when okay. you say like, yeah, I was just gonna say I mean, like, be careful. I mean, like three and four, but we can ignore those. I mean, yeah. like the real ones. One, I just wanted to make sure that you were acknowledging that those movies do actually exist. Yes, they are terrible and they shouldn't really count. But no, they no. do exist. I meant like you know, Superman two, Superman Returns, Man of Steel. I like things about all those movies, and my thoughts on Man of Steel are all over the place because that's the, the firestorm around that movie was as annoying as any anything in the movie. So whatever, I need to go back and revisit it before yeah. Batman v Superman, but. Um, yeah, so, it's weird. Superman, like, I just want one of these Superman who's been a good Superman to get a chance to really show it. Yeah. No, that's what I've been fucking saying <laughs> yeah. the whole time. That's why I didn't like Man of Steel, is I felt that it wasn't Superman yet. Yeah. So, but thinking about, like, those bad Superman movies, now that you're a huge fan of Supergirl from that TV show, yes. do you think you're going to go back and watch the Supergirl movie that they made? <laughs> Back in the day, here's, the Christopher Reeve Superman continuity. Oh, here's the thing. So that was made by the people who made the Christopher Reeve Superman yes, movies. Yes, it was. But my Superman DVD set, like that big tin set, which yeah. I love that set. Yeah, it's, it's got, a really good set. I've seen it's, it. it's awesome. It's got some shitty movies, but it's worth watching them just because the stuff around it is so cool. That doesn't have Supergirl in it. And I wish it did, because if it did, absolutely. Because there's no risk of it to me. I just have to sit down and watch the movie. Yeah. I'd have to go like find whatever... Sh I don't know if it's even out on DVD. I don't know how you find it either. That feels like a movie that only ever got released on like VHS for a yeah. very small amount of time. Um, That's like a movie that you'd find at a thrift store or something in the VHS section. Yeah. I want to say Helen Slater, who played Superman and Supergirl in that, is going to be on the Supergirl TV show at some point. Because that's something they like to do in the Greg Berlanti shows is bring on people who played the characters before to do new things. Like on Flash, Flash's dad is played by the guy who played Flash in the 90s show. Cool. So they like doing things like that. So, yeah, maybe I'll just see that. But, no, I if I have to actively seek it out, I probably won't. That's a really good point that it is a movie that you don't necessarily want to go out of your way to see it. But if it dropped into your lap, it's like... I have been watching this Supergirl TV show, and there's a Supergirl movie. It would be fascinating, wouldn't it? I mean, on that level, it would just be like, as a like piece of film history to see it. <laughs> It'd be great if they tried to like capitalize off of the popularity of the Supergirl TV show, and like they made a new print, like Blu-ray printing of the Supergirl movie, and put it out in the stores to try to trick unsuspecting families. It's like, 
my daughter really loves that Supergirl TV show. Oh, I didn't know they made a movie out of it. <laughs> Buy the movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Supergirl, still good. The last week's episode was the one where they adapted the Alan Moore story for the Magic. Oh, how series. was that? It was okay. Oh. It, it was very... That was episode 13. So very clearly that was the end of their initial order. And they wanted to cram in as much as they could in case of getting canceled. Hmm. So it feels like a two-parter that was shoved into one episode. So like that half of the episode is... It, of that, Like the half of the episode that is the Alan Moore story, it's only like 20 minutes. Oh. And they don't give it nearly enough time to breathe. I don't think it's bad. It's just if you're comparing it to this all-time great story, it's not that. Yeah. So it's a good episode, but it feels like it's you really whiplashy because in 40 minutes they do what should have been probably 90 minutes worth of material, and it's a little just like I said, whiplashy. So I'm looking forward to next week when they knew they had more episodes to work with and right. they, they can just keep telling the story because it really felt like emergency finale time. Let's do this, and that happens on lots of shows. Yeah, but. yeah, that happens all the time. It's one of the things I love about Firefly, that Joss Whedon did not feel the need to do that. And that one, the end, the final episode of that show is in no way an ending. But, but it's, it's still the best, the best episode of that show. It's brilliant, because he just decided, okay, I'm going to go weird and existentialist. Yeah, and, like fucking crazy bounty hunter dude. That episode's yeah. great. Yes, that's the way you should do it. Just forget about tying up plots, just do some weird story you always wanted to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but Supergirl will live another day, and it's good. I am enjoying it a lot, and I think... The Flash had its by far best episode of this season last week, too. And it was the first episode of this season where I thought The Flash outdid Supergirl for once. Because The Flash has just been a little messy this year. They've been setting up the spinoff, and it's been fine, but it's had a little too much going on. And then they finally, they went to Earth 2. And oh, it was nice. fucking great. Nice. Fucking great. Worth, worth, even if there had been like legitimately bad episodes, which I don't think there were, it would have been worth it all just to get to Earth 2. And yeah. And that they did do as a two-parter, so I'm excited for this week. Nice. Anyway, that's Jonathan's update on DC comic shows. All right. Which are better than DC movies. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. Let's move on. Uh, oh, by the way, how was the fourth X-Files? Oh, it was good. Yeah. Yeah. I figured this has been like a week since we recorded the last week's podcast while it was airing. I think it was probably my least favorite of the ones so far. It's not. I don't think it's a bad episode, but it's the least interesting because it's trying to balance a lot of like some really heavy dramatic material with like Scully where they like they really fucking went in on the like you know baby William like her baby that she gave up to adoption because she was afraid of the government getting to it because it's the X-Files and that's probably the right decision to make if I were to guess of like how that could have gone either way but like that obviously leaves a lot of sort of like emotional issues and they sort of trying to tangle that into her storyline and then also having what is like a really great uh, Monster of the Week episode on its own that didn't get enough time to develop because it had to like trying to balance it. Where it was like about this garbage man that like this guy was sort of like this graffiti artist was painting this uh, sort of like really like horrific figure in the streets because of all this sort of uh, remodeling that was going on in the city, displacing the homeless and the homeless were being abused. And so he was like putting this up as like kind of a threat to the people uh, like on this remodeling city remodeling project, and then also as like a like sort of like symbol of guardian for the homeless, and then it like comes to life and starts murdering people. And it's really great. It's really creepy. There's this incredible sequence halfway through the episode where it, uh, the garbage man invades this like woman's house and kills her. That's like involved with the project. I can't remember what song it's playing. It's playing some like fifties pop song that's like really cheery pop song over it. What's like this? It's like you would never be able to get away with this in the 90s when the X-Files aired, like how gruesome, like he rips these people apart. Like network television has come a really long way in terms of the violence you can get away with. So yeah, it, it was an episode that has a lot of really good parts that doesn't fully come together, but it's still really worth watching. So it's okay. like they have not had a complete miss yet, in my opinion. Yeah, I went back and started watching the X-Files season one. I got three or four episodes in, uh, and I know I haven't had time to watch more, but it's a good show. Yeah, it is. I know the early stuff isn't the best. So yeah, I'm it takes of... a bit to find its footing for sure. Yeah, but... You know who didn't take a bit to find their footing? is David Duchovny and Gillian Anderson. Yeah. They're no, fucking great they're from really beat good. one, and that's so fun. I also, just thinking about X-Files, I watched the other day, because I've just been sort of like picking at some of my like favorite episodes that I've seen in the past when I'm eating lunch or something. And there's one that I was like, I remembered being really good and been, remember kind of being gross, but I like kind of hit it, because I was like sort of like going chronologically and like scrolling through episodes, and when I hit one, I was like, oh, I remember this one being good, I would watch it. I hit this one, it's called Home, and it is... Probably the most, like, sort of, like, disgusting, just, like, morally fucked up story I've ever seen. And, like, it 
it, I feel like because the last time I saw this these episodes was when I was in high school. It's like it's hit me a lot harder as an adult than it did when I was a teenager. Where it's about like incest and like it is fucked up. And if you want to well, see, I'm, as an outsider, I've heard of that one a lot. If you want to see a super fucked up episode of television, watch Home because I can't believe that that ever got made for like a wide audience at all. Like it's more fucked up than like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and The Hills Have Eyes, which are like clear inspirations for some of the material in that movie. And it's like that movie goes like. Way darker! Like, holy shit, that episode is fucked up! Oh my god! Nice. Yeah, go watch Home if, you, if you're if you interested. Yeah, I just noticed also just watching them, the HD remaster that's out now for those. It's really nice. It looks yeah, good. Yeah, it looks really good. It's rough in the pilot because the pilot wasn't protected for 16.9, so they basically nah. had to crop it. But then the other ones, they just opened the mat and did some creative stuff. And it looks... It's a well-shot show to begin with, yeah. so it looks nice. And yeah. Just want to mention that. Um... We're off on a lot of tangents. So, the next two notes, we're going to hit really quick because they're duh. Uh, no Assassin's Creed this year confirmed. Yeah, which is like that was a rumor coming out of Kotaku. It yeah, so. Likely. It's nice to know that like Ubisoft is finally listening to what everyone has been yelling at them since Assassin's Creed Revelations yeah. came out. Just, hey, take a year off, guys. Slow down, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, we already talked about that last week, I think. And uh, Destiny, there will not be a Destiny 2 this year, but there will be another, it sounds like, Taken King kind of expansion. Yeah. Which I assume will incorporate what they were thinking of for this first version of Destiny 2. Clearly, if you haven't been following it, there's been a lot of behind-the-scenes turmoil with Destiny, and I don't think anyone really knows what's up, but Destiny is always having some problem or another, and it seems like uh, this is another shift. Still, it makes sense, I think, letting this version of Destiny bake a little while longer before Destiny 2 feels more appropriate to me i don't know yeah yeah like i think i think I, I don't really i'm not like worried about it like i think it's yeah. probably actually smarter to hold off yes. on a destiny 2 because i don't like because i don't even know what a destiny 2 is like assume that's a like a full new game but i don't know like how they're going to incorporate the incorporate well, the old stuff with it yeah and it sounded like before this maybe they were planning on destiny 2 just being a bigger upgrade frankly and it sounds like now it will be its own thing. And maybe yeah. it'll incorporate some of the spaces from Destiny 1, but it will be a new game. And I think that's a better idea than just I think so too. iterating on something that already... I mean, that's the other thing. is Destiny 2 in this way could be a full-on next-gen game, whereas Destiny 1 was straddling generations. Yeah, and it's just something where I feel like if they need an opportunity to leave behind a lot of the mistakes they made in Destiny 1. That's yes. like the Taken King fixed a lot of it, but like some of those underlying issues are still there without a doubt. Like being able to sort of like take what you learned and like what they've proved that they've learned by making the Dagon King as good as it is and like sort of building up a whole new base in Destiny 2 I think that would that's the, the road that's the path I'm more interested in yes and it means we'll get another Taken King style thing this year and I love the idea that Destiny could be on our top 10 list three years in a row yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe, no, maybe we'll just have to disqualify it at a certain point but if it's really good why yeah, not yeah no, so anyway it's yeah if, if the next expansion is as big and as good as the taken king is like i will be a happy camper when that comes out absolutely so let's go ahead and move on and talk about persona this is where we get into the topic so if you're not interested in persona fuck you we gave you like an hour and a half yeah way more than we thought we were going to so this got away from us but let's go ahead and move on and talk about persona if you're still here we love you because you like persona too i, I mean also but yeah maybe, but hey if you like persona too like Hey, I like Persona 2. Yeah, I haven't played it yet, but one day I, I will quit my job and devote <laughs> my life to play Persona 2. Yeah. All right. Anyway, let's talk about Persona 3, the movie number three, Falling Down. As always, just go through the Blu-ray set really quick. It's got Ryoji on the cover. Yes. Really nice cover image. And you'll we'll talk why in a minute Like it makes sense for Ryoji to be the image on this one, even though that's not intuitive if you've played the game. Yeah. And as always, comes a lot of nice stuff. They have the soundtrack and the Blu-ray in one case. Which, as always, they have the coolest fucking art on these yeah. things. Uh, and then it's got the normal postcards where it's got all the posters for the movie. Which I always love these. Because you get little like printouts of those. Yeah. You get the booklet. This booklet is particularly cool. I just Some of the images and stuff in this one, I was flipping through it. It's got storyboards and stuff. And lyrics. There's a lot of lyrics in this movie, so it's got all the lyrics for you. And I like that. And then the translation booklet. And I don't have it with me, but they gave you the stickers. So all the stuff you got in the other ones... They're still doing it. You're, you pay a lot of money, yeah. but you get a really good, nice box set. So, still worth it. High quality package. High quality package. And, again, I'm probably rubbing salt in the wound, because if you didn't get it by now, you're probably never going to. Because they sell out after pre-order. Yeah. Anyway. 
Um, but yeah, so that's it. But Sean, the movie. Yes. Um, let's recap our thoughts on one and two really quick. Okay. I mean, mostly it's being impressed, but I think really at this point, it's not talking about. I think it's a given that these movies are good. Yes. Once we got past number one, it's like they did it. Mm-hmm. They're, they're doing this. It's not that so much as how are they good. And it's yeah. really fascinating. So that first movie we were impressed by Makoto, the main character, because that's really what that movie is about, and finding a way to make what is a silent protagonist in the game somewhat interesting. Yes. And they did that fantastically. And then in movie two, having to do a ton of story that runs a tonal gamut and make it cohesive and show that they can make these movies movies first and foremost and not just pieces of a puzzle. Yeah. And they did that. Yes. Movie two has a bit of a rough opening, just and there's a lot of exposition. But once it gets off to the races, movie two is a punch to the gut. Yes, without a doubt. I, I rewatched it earlier today. Yep. The editing still hurts. Yep. And then movie three now, we have, I think, what is easily the biggest challenge in this series so far. Mm-hmm. Like, I actually think in some ways number four will be the easiest for them to make because it has an ending. It's a clear arc. It's yeah, it's like, like, because it's, they have, they've left themselves what is like, to me, the juiciest part of that whole game, which is January yeah. It's like, and that is like what they have to adapt in the next movie. It's yes. like, that is, yeah, like you said, it's self-contained. It's like, it's a nice meaty chunk of story that has like an incredibly impactful ending. Yeah. Yeah. Like the job is almost done for them. But the space between movies two and movie four is so difficult to know what to do with. Because what happens in that space is, you know, you have the betrayal by Akutsuki. You have yeah. the, you know, defeating of the final 12 shadows. You have some of the bigger show-offs with Strega, including the death of Chidori, yeah. and all those things. But in You have the, like most of the characters developing their like advanced versions of their personas. Yes. But that is one of the most heavily you know, video gamey parts of Persona 3. Yeah. Because it's mostly about the day-to-day. It's about your social links. It's about getting to the top of Tartarus. It's about just little cutscenes and things. And it is so shapeless as a story and in the game that's not a bad thing because it's part of a larger narrative and it's fine and I love that section of the game it's also where you have Ryoji and Ryoji is a very weird part of that game I think it works completely in the game you could never do it like that in a movie no no yeah yeah so with this movie what they chose to do is kind of turn into the skid pick this overall theme which is go on the fallout of Shinji's death in movie two yeah and say okay what would that do to the Makoto we have made, who is this broken, disturbed boy, and what would a real death mean to him? And it's, what does life mean if there is death? And that's the yeah. question of movie three. All that, those story points are still hit, but they're downplayed to the point where this is by far the most off-book of the movies. Yes. Yeah. They're inventing a lot of material. I think the weight in this is much more skewed towards the small moments and the things that are just there for the movie. And in a way... I don't know if I would call this the best of the three movies, but I think it's the most effective. Like, it worked me over really heavily in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's it's certainly one of the most impressive to me, because as you said, like, it's... It was it would be very easy for this movie to have felt completely aimless. And honestly, like, all of the movies could have been like that very easily. Because that's one of the main things about adapting existing source material like that, especially if you're breaking it up into pieces. I mean, you can look at the Hobbit trilogy for a really bad example, particularly in the last two movies of this, where, like, you're trying to adapt this source material and trying to find ways to make it work in a movie format, but you're... But, like, you lose sight of, like, actually telling a story in doing so, you know? And these movies have been... All three of them have been so good about finding a, like, very specific theme to focus on, attaching that theme in a way to your main character... And then using that as a way to develop all of your cast and then create like a strong three act structure that like ends in a climactic moment that like punctuates the themes of the movie. And all three of them have done that like perfectly. Yes. In a way that I feel like these movies could like these movies are not the greatest movies ever made or anything like that, but they are really good movies. And I think if you were someone who was very interested in screenwriting and like the theory of adapting source material, they are really great examples of that, of how like picking out things that are a part of the game but are not necessarily put like under the microscope in the way that these movies do and t- finding them and putting them under the microscope and making this them like pieces of that story like very explicitly that's what these movies do and in some ways they come up with those themes uniquely through the, their like newly made main character and how like players might react to those themes in the game oh i am so fascinated in general in my you know film scholarship in the theories of like adaptation and i'm fascinated in the ways good and sometimes bad movie adaptations 
choose to do an adaptation and yeah. what's fascinating about that and these would go right to the top of my list as teachable examples because it's not that these are like better than the game and there's no yeah. way they could be because the game is a very unique thing and it relies on the gaming medium but the things they choose to adapt they generally do better than the game yeah. because they're picking things that the game by virtue of what it is can't do in that way they pick things that they can do cinematically and adapt in that medium and then make them more meaningful than they were in the game so if the overall experience you know, it's a different experience. Yeah. It's kind of like if I look at my favorite Harry Potter movies or my favorite parts of Lord of the Rings where they really take things from the books and do something different with it and suddenly it becomes this different kind of vibrant work of art. A separate, like not better, not worse than, but just existing as its own thing from the source material. And that's why we do adaptations. Yeah. It's kind of like one of the things I will... I know always take shit for is that I'm not a fan of the Shawshank Redemption that movie. Oh yeah, and that is because the way they taught that to us in film school. I didn't see that until film school, and the way they okay. taught it was go read the Stephen King book and then come watch the movie. And so the day of that, it's like a 200 page Stephen King book. So I read the whole thing and then went to watch the movie. And I think that I think it's the best thing Stephen King's ever written. I think it's a phenomenal novella. If you've never read it, I know you're not a huge Stephen King fan. Yeah. You should read that because that is fucking brilliant and it's like tight, two hundred pages. Yeah, it's really a novella. It's in fact collected in uh, with other stories, so you can still have an eight hundred page Stephen King book. Yeah. Um, but then I, I went to see the movie, and the movie is just the book, beat for beat, but with all the rough edges sanded off. And it disappointed me because it's like I'm not getting anything more, and where the book really hit me, I'm actually getting less. So I recognize that it's a good movie, it's a well-made movie, it's a well-acted movie. It did nothing for me because I'd read the book. And as a work of adaptation, I think it's really lackluster. And so that's what I'm saying. Like That's, that's kind of one of those things about adaptation that is fascinating. Is it's not as easy as just doing what you had accurately. And these Persona movies are such great examples of that. Because if you really think about it, m many of the things we love in the, the games, obviously it's not here and it can't yeah. be. But there are things that they pick up on that I would, if I were set out to, you know, write these movies, I would never pick up on it. That yeah. that could be the the crux of it. And I think the key for me here is Ryoji in this movie. Because Ryoji is a plot device in the game. Yeah. And he's there to be kind of a mystery, to have some, really to further Igus's plot, if anything. Yeah. Um, and to just work you towards this revelation that the movie actually doesn't even get to this time. Um, that he is the harbinger of death, and and you have to make a choice related to him, and you can do something really gruesome. Yeah, you get the bad ending. Yeah, the real bad ending. Yes, I like that. This it would have been hilarious if this movie went up to that point and like had two different endings that you could watch. Oh yeah, that'd be great. They yeah. made two different movie number fours. Yes, be great. A movie the movie, movie number, number four number two is really short. short. Yeah, <laughs> it's just the cutscene from the game. Yeah. Anyway, no. Um, because what they've done with Ryoji is made him into a symbol this time of what the theme of the movie is, which is enjoying life for what it means and, and yeah. what it gives us. And they've made this decision where in the game it's just um, Weird Boy. What's his actual name? What? Two. The, the Weird Boy who'd visit you at, at your dreams. And they, oh, uh, Pharos? Pharos, yeah. yeah. They just named him Weird Boy for the first like half of that game, right? Right. That's or probably... I don't, I don't remember. Okay, anyway. Pharos and... And Pharos makes a conscious decision that he sees Makoto as suffering and he decides, I'm going to go become Ryoji, basically. Yeah. And I'm going to come down to the human plane. Which is very different than in the game, where Pharos does not come to this awakening. He just disappears, sort of. Yeah. And, and then Ryoji enters the movie just as you think. And I was thinking this, oh God, is this movie just going to be a 90-minute wallow? That could work, but I don't think that's Persona at that point. Yeah. Because Persona is never a wallow in anything. Yeah. It's very varied and dynamic. And once Ryoji enters and he is basically just his mission in his brief existence is just to have fun and get other people to be happy, primarily Makoto, the movie takes off in a way where there's nothing really flashy in this one. There's not a lot of fighting. The visuals are fantastic, but there's not as many moments to show off. Yeah, like you don't have as much like of the really sort of surreal dark hour yeah. moments, you know? Yeah, but... Again, I felt myself being worked over because it's really funny. I think it's the funniest of the three yeah. movies. And yet each of those funny moments has a poignancy that just hits you in the gut because what it's about is the transience of life and enjoying things in the moment. And all these things that the game, it's more about the experiential aspect about that, so they're not telling you it. Whereas yeah. the movie can do this in a more cinematic way where they really want you to feel that as a theme. And it really hit me. And just being a fan of the game, 
it's like, yeah, this is, it's almost like a great essay on the game while being a good adaptation of the game. That's a really good way of putting it. That it is like, it feels like it is an interpretation of the game's story in a lot of ways. And that like, and it is the way that they build out uh, Yuki as the main character that like, and I think they've done such a good job of basing sort of the themes of each of the movies around him. And that was like in the first movie, it was about him sort of learning to care about himself and to care about life in any way because he was so empty. In the second movie, it was about him sort of having to learn like the import, like the actual importance of these relationships and like having to like learn faith and trust in people and that like he was so caught up in the idea of like his life fighting these shadows that's like he forgot about what's actually important about like that it, he didn't enjoy fighting the shadows he enjoyed the relationships that he had and he had those relationships as a virtue of his position as a part of this team but just because the team goes away does not mean that those bonds go away it's like and he has to learn that lesson really hard in that second movie and it bites him in the ass and so then this third movie i what i think is really fascinating about it is that you see him trying to go back to who he was at the beginning of the first movie and not being able to do it and it like that's like it's impossible for him to go back and to like build that shell again and to not care anymore and as much as he tries to sort of pretend that's not possible like he's made these bonds and he can't hide from it anymore yeah and it's like ryoji is almost like this guardian angel it's like it's a wonderful life he sees yeah makoto suffering and comes down and i love his intro in this movie where makoto goes out one night and ryoji is just sitting on top of the train station yeah and like jumps down with his big fucking scarf yeah and it's really cool the animators have a lot of fun with his big scarf in this movie yes but it's pretty poignant all of that stuff yeah. because as you say it's makoto trying to be the person he was and by virtue of not being able to the amount of change that has happened in the series really hits you hard yeah and sets you up for what is going to be an absolutely emotionally devastating final film. Yeah, because there's also, like, there's a weird, like, second layer to watching this movie where you're like, yeah, no, like, you, like everyone should be, like, trying to get Makoto to sort of come out of his shell again and, like, to, like, learn how to live life and to have, spend time with his friends. It's like, I believe all of that. But then back then it's like, but I know where all this goes. Like, I know how this ends. I know that, like, hey, you're, like, signing his fucking death warrant because it's... The, only through having this, these bonds is he able to make the decision at the end, ultimately, that he's going to have to sacrifice himself. So it's, True. It's really fucking dark. But again, on that level where it is an interpretation of the game, is yeah. that I feel like it's so... These movies so heavily rely on you having played the game, not to fill in the plot. These movies no, have yeah. proven that I think you could watch these cold and you wouldn't be confused. Yeah. But where it is thematically is that... Because the flip side of that, Sean, what you said is totally true, but the flip side is that he also dies in peace because of it. That's true. He does not have regrets, and he goes to his death in a way where he's not afraid of it anymore. And that's the beauty of that ending to me. And that's kind of where we're headed, I think. It's this acceptance of it all. And and I think you're supposed to be thinking of both sides of that coin this entire movie. Yeah. And if you're not, I think the movie would still be fun and good and a rich experience. But it is so rich because... It is a dialogue between people who are intimate with the material and seeing it in this new light. Yeah. And I can't think of any analog for that, honestly. No, me neither. Because most, you know, movie adaptations, they're for both audiences. You know, they are just, they're telling a story, and if you've seen it before, great, and if you haven't, that's okay too. But one, it's not made more for one or the other, if it's good. But this is made for people who have, but not as a failure. You know, usually yeah. if it's like, this is made more for the fans, that's because it hasn't been done well, frankly. Yeah. That's not the case here. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's something where... It's like, man, I'm just trying to think of like all the, the choices that they have to make in this movie on like how, how you adapt these materials, how you have to write this main character... And it's like, and it's like, man, they go like the tough route too, because it's like I've seen this theme is not uncommon. It's particularly not uncommon in anime, where you have a lot of very brooding protagonists, where you have like the like whole, I'm not going to try to get close to people because if I do, when they they get hurt or when they die and when I lose them, it will hurt even more for me. Like that's not an uncommon theme, and but I feel like there's a like there's a brutality to that theme. That most things don't take the next step that this movie does in like two ways, like in two basically scenes of like that, like, yes, like you shouldn't use that as an excuse to retreat into yourself and to escape from life. But at the same time, hey, man, it's still going to fucking hurt. Yes. Like, hey, man, these people are still going to die. Like, hey, people are still going to betray you. Like, that's not going to stop happening just because you came out of your shell. And I feel like the most times I see this theme tried to, like, kind of tackled, they always stop before it's ever going to get to that point again. Whereas here, it's like, you have all of that, 
And then you also have Chidori dying, which is like, there's a lot of like sort of self fulfillment in in that. And, you know, like uh, Junpei says at the end of the movie that he's glad that he met her and he's still glad that he fell in love with her. But at the same time, like, it still fucking hurts. The last shot of Junpei in the movie is him standing alone in the stairwell. Yeah, and like pocketing his, the, the heirloom that he bought for her when that he was he'll never on, get to Yeah, that he'll never be able to get to give her. And then at the very end of the movie, you finally, you get that scene where Makoto's like, hey, like, I, Ryoji, I, I accept your friendship. Like, I accept this relation, these relationships. I'm willing to, like, care again. And then, like, five minutes later, it's, oh, the other shoe drops. And, hey, this is not going to work out well. And that's where the movie stops. Yeah. And the ending is the hardest part for me to figure out my feelings on. Because yeah. this movie really doesn't have an ending. It's, it, or like a, a concrete plot one. And movies one and two do. Like, there is a clear climax and ending. Yeah. And... It's not like the story is over, but you can put it away and then go for another couple months without seeing it, and it's fine. Yeah. This one is a cliffhanger. But I think it's thematically very appropriate, because you could very easily, and I don't think it would hurt the movie, go to the next step and, and do the exposition dump that you get there. But that they end on the evocative note of, oh shit, not only is Ryoji not who you thought he was, but he's this person and he's just fucked up I guess. Yeah. And so everything goes to shit. And it just let it be provocative and let it hang. Perfect. Yeah. It's really perfect. The more I think about it, it's like, yes, that's how it has to end. I mean, it's like the second, like, like I'm so fresh off the second movie, too. The second movie ends with them at the funeral. Not, I guess it's not technically the funeral, but they're at the school, like at like that assembly or whatever. And the last shot of the movie is just hanging on Makoto's face as he's staring at the, the portrait of Shinji that's up on the stage. And it's like, and that's the last shot. It's just his like pale face and that's it. And this has like a similar thing. Yeah. It's just, Where it kind of stops right when it needs to stop. It's the evocative ending, not yeah. the literal ending, and I yeah. like that. It's, it doesn't. It doesn't tie everything up because it can't because it's a, it's a, it's a chain and a link, you know. Yeah. And it it tells a story that it needs to tell in terms of it completing the ideas of its theme, and that the fourth movie does not have to be about what the third movie is about in the way that the third movie is not about what the second movie is about or the first movie is about. They all have all three of them have really clear, distinct themes and ideas playing through. While the like overall plot of the game is slowly marching forward towards the inevitable climax, yes. So it's like, yeah, it does. It can't have like the distinct sort of literal plot exposition y kind of ending where it's like, well, things are wrapped up and it's over because it's not over. But it does get to end on the sort of like closing argument about the theme of the movie, which is what it needs to be. It's why these work so well as standalone films, even while they are adapting a larger overall story. Yeah. So smart. Just every... I, I turn to you halfway through the movie like, this is really good. And I'm amazed because I keep waiting for them to fuck it up somehow. Yeah. And not that I expect them to, but there are so many points where you could. That's all I mean. Yeah. And this movie in particular, I mean, this movie is basically built on stuff that I honestly kind of thought might just get cut. Mm -hmm. You know? It's kind of funny to me that the biggest scene in this movie in the game, which is the Akutsuki betrayal, I think is the weakest scene in this movie. In uh, yeah, I think so too. It feels like it's sort of... There because it needs to be there and it's sort of like yeah it just has a really awkward placing in terms of how they decided to organize the movies because when I first heard they were going to do this as a project I expected that to be the end of one of the movies yeah me too and I think clearly once you get to the end of film two they could have done it that way but it would have been really awkward because yeah. there's just not that much space in between there mm -hmm. they could have moved things around or something but so it's the beginning of a movie and then well what do you have you have Ryoji and you have this trip to Kyoto. And you have Chidori. And these are all things that could have been cut or altered. And you wouldn't blame them for it. Yeah. Because they're not incidental to the game. But they're part of, like I said, it's like a part of a, just a larger, again, it's a 60-hour game. This is going to be a six-hour series when done. Most of it's getting cut. Yeah. And you wouldn't blame them for wanting to cut those things. And instead, they take these things that really could be hard to know what to do with in the larger story. And say, let's make these the pillars of a bigger thematic purpose. Yeah. And so Chidori and Junpei's relationship becomes... A key pillar of this, and the trip to Kyoto becomes the key moment of healing and of humor, and all the stuff with Ryoji becomes this key element of Makoto's character development, and it's, and then the stuff with the Kutsuki becomes the kickoff point to that, where they're kicked as low as they can be, yeah, and then they have to find a way to pick themselves up, and the way they pick themselves up is through each other, and so, in the most unexpected place, they find this grace that is unexpected for fans of the game because that's not the theme of the game at that point. Yeah, no, I mean it's something where you because you also have. Like, a bunch of these, what are to me, like, really iconic scenes from the game. Like, several of them where you have, like, Akihiko alone at Shinji's funeral. 
like talking to him and like basically talking to himself. You have the the conversation between Yuk- uh, Yukari and Kirijo. You have uh, I can't remember what the third one was going to be, but like you have Fuka those... on the roof with Fuka on the roof. Yeah, like you have, but you, yeah, you have these like key. To... Oh, and you have Jinpei and Chidori and like Chidori dying and like all the parts of those. Like you have all those scenes that are like really important sort of big moments on their own in the story that like like you said like some of those could be cut or like rearranged but what's really fascinating about how this movie handles it is it takes all these scenes that I remember really distinctly from the game and adapting them more or less straight like there's not this not like literally the exact same scenes but they're like really similar but the the scenes feel very different because there's juxtaposed in very different ways i mean like the akihiko one is in a totally different spot because that would be at the very end of movie number two and it would be out of place yeah it would be like if you were doing it chronologically like that would be at the beginning of movie number three would be the scene with akihiko but they make it this flashback when he's having a conversation with yuki and that's so smart how they keep these like really critical scenes for these other characters for all the supporting characters because they all have those moments in the latter part of the game and keeping those, but recontextualizing them for, to be used in the overall theme of the movie and, like, how it's attached to the theme of the main character and what the main character's journey is. And it's like, that is incredible to me. That it's like, you didn't cut anything. You've just recontextualized all of it with your own sort of story and your own energy. Yeah, yeah. And it just the moment where I realized this movie was taking off for me is when Ryoji comes up to Makoto has this very funny encounter with Tanaka from yeah. Tanaka's Amazing Commodities where they work in a cameo by both Tanaka and the little girl at yeah. the Maiko uh, I think her name Ma- is. yeah Maiko from the uh, playground and I like that they still do the little references to the social links yeah and although every time I see the is that Kenji's his name your classmate in the background I'm like is he still trying to hook up with his teacher is that story still going on <laughs> and we just don't see it because that's the weirdest social link in any of these games is him trying to be in a relationship with this goddamn teacher it's so good yeah love that one anyway but uh yeah so you have that scene and then as a result of a series of events Makoto owes money to Tanaka, so he has to go make some money. And really, I think the implication is he's just trying to numb himself. I don't think he really cares about making the money. Yeah. Like, I, I think if he were in a better place mentally, he would just walk away from Tanaka and forget about it. Or just fucking kill him right there, man. He's got a persona. I can summon fire from on high, bitch. You don't talk to me like that. Fire? You can get Jack Frost out there yeah. and laugh at Tanaka. Yo ho ho, bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna have a little walk with Jack Frost, that's what I'm saying. All right, so he doesn't do that, and he has to make some money, so he goes to the coffee shop where you go in the game to get your pheromone coffee yeah. and all that, and uh, he he gets a job there, and then Ryoji comes in and gets a job too, so just he can hang out with uh, Makoto and try yeah. to cheer him up. And then he also starts this this business at school with Makoto where they go around and do help for people. and yeah, they help just people. little like odd jobs. Odd jobs, and at this point, they're totally off the range. This yeah. is not in the game at all. And I mean, yet, it couldn't even be in no. the game. Like, it wouldn't have worked, like, mechanically. No. And so, this is all new, but you're like, this is really, A, funny. They have found a way to inject humor into this movie, and at that point in the movie, I thought they weren't going to be able to do it. I'm like, where do they get the jokes? Because they have to have some of it. Persona yeah. is funny, and that's one of the things about it, is that it recognizes life has highs and lows. Yeah. And it gives you those lows, but yes, it also it gives you those highs. It gives funny as good it's as like it gives It's like Nanako sad. as a character is like emblematic of that, that yes. she like gives you like some of the funniest, lightest moments in the game in Persona 4, and the single darkest moment in the entirety of Persona 4. Yeah, and if you win a whole Persona movie and it was just dark... That wouldn't feel right. Maybe yeah. they can do it with number four. That's okay. Yeah. But if you did it with number three, it would just be a little bit of a slog. And instead, it's, it's really funny, but not sacrificing the poignancy. And it's very smart. And that's the point where I realized, okay, not only do they get this, they are reaching for something. And they have an ambition here that yeah. goes beyond just solid adaptation. It really is, as you say, an interpretation and a very smart one. And all of that just, I had a smile on my face. And also a twist in my chest. Just Yeah, because it is... Because it's so... Because it's not only that it has, like, these really funny moments that are really funny and these lighter moments, but it's like it knows how to, like, deploy them tactically. That it's it uses it because it's so germane to the theme. That, like, the whole idea is that, like, yeah, there's some super fucking dark shit about life. And, like, life can be really fucked up. And these movies are not afraid of showing those parts. But, like, the whole point of the movie is everyone basically trying to convince uh, Yuki 
that like that's not the only thing that life has because obviously that's not the only thing that life has and if you ignore all the like the great funny weird stuff and all the fun you can have hanging out with your friends and like like the wacky antics that ensue and seeing like the bright side of life like what point is there anymore and so it is 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 what makes that like kyoto trip that is sort of like felt like it's a fun part of the game but kind of an aimless part of the game i think you used that word it's like i totally agree with that and here it feels so powerful and integral that it's like because it's such a cathartic trip and for it was mostly in the game a cathartic trip for uh, Kirijo and uh, Misuru and uh, Yukari. But here it's just like a cathartic trip for the entire movie. Because like everyone has these like issues like underneath that are still are, like still boiling and bubbling. And just going on this trip and just getting to be like crazy and wacky and get up to all this like fucking bullshit. It, like, it, it makes you sort of appreciate the themes and like that other side of it. Which then makes it all the harder once you go into it. It's like oh yeah but then you know they, all the bad shit's gonna happen now. It all goes south from here. Well, and coming back from that trip and having the Chidori scene, which is as hard hitting in the movie as it is in the game. Yeah. Arguably harder hitting in the movie because of how they've pinpointed that. Yeah. And yeah, I don't think we're going to have the forced resurrection scene from Fess no. in this version. Yeah. yeah, I'm really glad that because that's like not the. It's not the canonical version of how that goes. No. Like, like Persona 4, the Ultimax Ultra Suplex Hold. Basically confirms that like the is going off of that that she dies in, in yes. Persona Three because that's a part of Junpei's story there. So yeah, I'm really I didn't think that they were going to. I'm really glad they didn't because that was a stupid part that they added to Fest. Yeah. So it's like the only thing about Fest that like makes it a like weak version of that game in any way. Yeah. So anyway, um, all good. Let's talk about specific moments. Okay. The version of the uh, hot spring scene. Yeah. In this movie. Is fucking phenomenal. Because Persona does their hot spring scenes. Because it's an anime standby. All anime has to have a scene where boys get in a hot spring. And they're looking at girls and they shouldn't be. And they didn't mean to be there. And it's a fuck up. Yeah, and it's all... It's just a massive misunderstanding. But yes. something something's going to happen. It is It is a... It's a tradition. Yes. It needs to happen. And Persona does it well. Yes. But this is by far the best version ever done. Yeah. And the... At least in Persona. I don't mean like in all of anime. I don't know. There's, I have no. not seen all anime. No. But... Because um, all anime has it. One... Either symbolically or th- thematically. In some way it's in yes. there. Yeah. Um, but anyway... If you read between the lines, I'm sure like Nausicaa has it somewhere too. Yes. Yes. That's anyway. the entirety of the movie really. Yeah. <laughs> like there... It's all just one big hot spring, man. Yeah. Well that's the where... The earth is a hot spring. That's where the boy like Nausicaa's friend kind of finds her when she crashes and they... Yeah. They're in like the... the Sea of Decay version of a hot spring. Exactly. There you go. Uh, no, anyway. But the, if, if you haven't seen Persona 3, the movie number 3, the way they do it is... I mean, they have it. It's very well animated and all this, but it's their choice of music when it happens where they're trying to get out. Junpei realizes he doesn't have his towel so he can't run away with them. Yeah, and they start playing... Naked. They start playing the sad music from the end of movie number one yeah. where they're all about to die. Mm-hmm. And Makoto's like, I can't leave you behind, Junpei. And yeah. he's like, I've reached the end of the road. You go without me. It's... It's like they're just like it's like the super dramatic scene you've seen in everything where like someone has to be left behind, and this is kind of like one of the best versions of that scene I've ever done because they go so completely melodramatic for it. It's like I kind of got like emotionally worked up. Yes, it's like you know because they're all like, "No, we can't." It's like you've got to go without me. We can't leave you behind. It's like we all promised we'd survive this. What's funny is they go completely straight-faced yeah. in the music, in the staging, in the animation, everything, but you know how fundamentally silly it is. Yeah. And it's so great. Because they kind of do something a little like that in the game, but not that far. Yeah. And so the version of the movie is just phenomenal. Yeah, it's really great. And then earlier they have that moment where I guess like, shows up like outside the window of the room yes. in mass destruction. It's the second time, because in movie number two, they have a similar sort of scene with I guess where mass destruction plays comedically. It's like, they are getting way more comedic value out of the Mass Destruction song than I thought was... I didn't think that there would be one scene that did that. There's been two, yes. and they're both hilarious. Well, the scene with um, I guess leads to probably my favorite moment of the movie, where they have this big thing where I guess wants to... It's really funny, where yeah. I guess wants to switch rooms, like, Ryoji, you go to the girls' room, and I'll stay here. And I guess being a robot doesn't get what's a problem with that. Yeah. And Ryoji being a horned dog doesn't get yeah. that. And so they're all trying to climb out, and then they wind up breaking the balcony, falling into the water, and then Makoto, for the first time in the movie, just breaks out laughing. Like, practically for the first time in, like, the series. Like, he's... I don't know if he's ever laughed. Really. Yeah. That hit me. Yeah. Good God. That was a blow 
in the in like the most I had a huge smile and then also just your heart constricts in that moment. Yeah. It is so powerful and so perfect and just this it's like the the air is let out of the movie in this not in a bad way though. Like in yeah. this great like the movie opens up to new emotional horizons at that moment. And it's just so great. Yeah, because again, it's a scene that I have seen seen I feel like I said the word scene like five times. I've seen scenes like that before in other stuff. Like it's not an uncommon idea, but I don't think I've ever seen that scene work that well. Like I've always understood the idea of it, but I feel like it's so rare to get it executed because I feel like it requires such a delicate balance of tone to really pull off. Like you need something that has this really fundamental like somber melancholy to it that like where you have that real relief from when the humor does come in that makes it so that when Makoto laughs there, he's really laughing there. It's like there's a really infamous scene from Final Fantasy X that, like, you can find this everywhere because the dubbing of it is really awkward. And this is why it's so famous is because it's this really forced laugh scene. And it's like, if this is like that scene from Final Fantasy X where, where Tif- Tif- Titus and... What are, what's her face? Have Tifa? like laugh together. No, that's no, from Final Fantasy that's VII. Fine. I can't remember. Yuna, I think her name is. Okay. It's like they laugh on this dock and it's the dub is really bad and so it's a very infamous scene. But it's also just like a really awkward scene in Japanese. Like it's just like it's this scene but done really poorly. And so I've always sort of like had that idea that there's like you just can't really pull it off. Like it's too hard. Like I get the idea. I get the idea of like the, the, the tortured protagonist like finally having this brief moment of levity and having this true laugh that's like naturally comes out, but it never really worked for me. And here, like it really hit me hard. Yeah. Again, it's a movie that just knows what it's doing at every turn. Yeah. Okay. I want to talk about Igus for a second. Okay. Yes. Igus is really funny in this she movie. Is, yeah. And I maybe have bigger concerns about how much Igus we're getting and we can talk about that. Mm-hmm. But what I love, cause I have, I've only heard Igus in English, you know, yeah. before watching these movies. And in Japanese, I love how she talks about Ryoji because the first time she sees Ryoji, she just says, Anata wa dame desu. Yeah. And if you don't speak Japanese, the translation doesn't do it justice. Yeah. That is a ridiculously harsh thing to say about someone. Yeah, they, she You're, just says repeatedly over and over again. Yeah. It's like, you, I mean, because they say you are no good is how they translate it. And that's the proper translation. But I feel like... Dame means, is so harsh. But it's like, but, but it is the appropriate translation because it's like, you normally think like, oh, you're no good. Like... In English, we make that phrase really light. It's like, no, you are no good. Like, good, null. That's like, that's what it's a good equals zero. That's what that phrase means. Yeah, and she just says it over and over again. Yeah. It's, yeah, she's, her presence in this movie is hilarious. But also is like, again, knowing what's to come and knowing why she reacts to Ryoji that way already, it does make it all tragic even while it's funny. Also, I realize, I love Igus too because... With my limited understanding of Japanese, she speaks so robotically, I can understand all of it. Yeah. I don't need subtitles for I guess, and I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. She, she speaks in simple, short yeah. phrases. Yeah. Like, I know all these words. I, I can't do that for, like, Ryochi or someone. Yeah. But anyway, no, I guess is funny. I do wonder... I don't think Igus has been underserved, but it's just clearly she is a functioning as a slightly different character in the movies than she is in the game. And I wonder how the impact will feel... Where she's more part of an ensemble here, where I think in the game she's maybe first among equals in a lot of ways. Although I don't think she necessarily takes that place so much until January. Like she's definitely she has, I think, a little bit more because she's a she's the most sort of colorful character in the game because she's a robot and like yeah. she has like a lot of tragic stuff about her and she has like she's like the funniest character in the game as well. But like. I mean, you know, you don't get that social link with her until the last month of the game. Yes. It's not until the very end. And here, I think you do get, like... I think they're very smart about how they're using her in the sense that, like, they're de- they're using her only, like, usually to... Either, like, as like to deliver a bit of a joke a lot of the times, but also to really develop her attachment to uh, Yuki. In particular, you have that the scene where, like... She's kind of, like, all fucked up after uh, all the stuff that's happened. And she, like, finds him when he's out on the street and he hugs her. Like, I, that whole scene was heartbreaking. I thought, oh, like, that, great. like, I... really... Because cause they... And they have, like, a line in there that's not in the game. That's, like, she says, like, maybe this is the reason why I have, like, this eternity of life. Is so that I never have to leave you. Yeah. You know, that's, like... Because that's going to fucking... That's a beautiful... That's going to turn around on her really hard with yeah. the... the when Kimi no Kiyoku plays at the end of this fucking series. Yeah, it... 
It's amazing. I, I do think... I love every scene they've done with Igus. I think it's all brilliant. I'm just saying, I wonder how it'll turn out in the last one. And I'm just saying, I think that's the challenge next time. Yeah. Each of these movies has had a challenge. I think she's the challenge in the last yeah. movie. But I think it's like... But like... I think like what we said at the top of this discussion, the challenge is sort of set up for them, like right in front of them. That's like... Yeah. This is the movie about him and I guess like yeah the, and like because that's also already like in the game because that part of the game is structured a lot more like how these movies are where it does feel like it is pinpointing on this idea and this theme and this relationship between these two characters is completely about that so it's like they're they're set up I think to really succeed for the next movie oh I think so I, I'm just saying because they haven't failed at any of these challenges yeah. I'm just saying that's the challenge and but I, you are right she hasn't had. A huge prominence well, in the movies. It's just that I guess depends a little more even than the other characters on the fact that in Persona you go around, you talk to everyone, you get yeah. to know them. It's the kind of thing the movie can't recreate. Yeah. I'm not saying they can't make it work. It's just, it's the challenge. I'm, I'm, I think that's the thing is these movies are at their best when they have to overcome those challenges. Yeah. So I think the next one will be really fascinating to see how they do that because there are moments from that social link that are so fucking powerful that I do think they could adapt pretty straight in this. Yeah. If they do it that way, and we'll see. I wonder how long before it's out in Japan. I guess I could check, yeah. but I feel like that one could stand to be even longer than the ninety minutes the rest of them have been. Yeah, because yeah. just yeah, it's going to be really interesting. They've what's amazing to me about these movies is that they've kept all the big important pillars of the game. They're all in there. Yeah, like the, none of them have just. They haven't just knocked down any of those. Like I could again, I could imagine a Persona Three adaptation without Strega. Oh yeah, absolutely, easily. Yeah, but. They haven't chosen to go that route, and it's been the right choice. They do make the tapestry richer. Yeah. And and, and then you do get, like, I'm so excited. Because, like, I'm just really excited for the last movie for two things. I really want to see all the Igus stuff, because it's my favorite part of the game. I also am really excited about seeing some of the, the material that Takaya has. Yeah. Like, because that character is so fucking just menacing and malicious and st- just pure evil. He's so great. And the English dub version of him is amazing. I really like the Japanese version of him as well. Like he's, he's got this really deep yeah. voice. It's, he's not in this movie as much as he is in number two. But like every scene that he's in, it's like, fuck, this guy is evil. Like, oh my god. He's a great villain. He's great. And the stuff in Persona 3 is fascinating. Because I've never seen something like Takaya where they do humanize him. Like that yeah. is the arc in January for Takaya is he is humanized. But he doesn't become less evil. No, That's what's yeah. fascinating. Is usually you get sympathy. I don't think you get sympathy, but you do get empathy, and if anything, it makes him more terrifying. Yeah. That's yeah, that like you understand who he is and like you realize that like he's not just insane. Like it's like, no, yeah. there's there's something to this guy. He's still really fucking evil, but there's something to him. Yeah. It's really scary. It'll be fun to see that. I, I liked that Jin used his grenades in this yeah. movie. And when you think about it in the game, it's one of the most ridiculous things in the game. He's just throwing fucking grenades out. Yeah. And in this, it actually becomes like a thing where, you know, I guess has to like shoot them down and then she yeah. gets blasted back. And you're like, oh, right. This dude's fucking throwing grenades out yeah. there. Yeah, I, I, I caught that too as a fun film. Yeah. Like something that I didn't necessarily they expect they'd keep from the games, but I'm glad they did. If you haven't played the game where you don't remember, he's like, in the, when you're fighting him, he's just like tossing a grenade in his palm. Yeah, because that's his, like, it's like how, like, you know, your character has like a sword and Shinji has an axe and stuff like that. Yeah. And Akiko just punches people because he's really cool. Yeah. yeah. Jin just chucks fucking hand grenades at people. I, I have no idea where he got them because this is supposedly, it's set in Japan where. Like, gun restrictions are way harsher in Japan than they are in America. I think it's probably kind of hard to find a hand grenade even in America. I can't imagine how hard it would be to get your hands on a fucking grenade in Japan. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, I want to talk about Mitsuru. Okay. Because I think she's been the character most underserved of the main cast in the movie so far. Yeah. And I think this movie doesn't completely reverse that. I still think she'll be the one... In this series, the most kind of marginalized, just by necessity of the story. Yeah. But I think this movie took some very necessary steps to make her feel more integral. Yeah. And all of her material is great. And I think particularly the scene, which is the Persona Evolution scene from the game, where she and um, Yukari Yukari have this conversation on the uh, on the Kyoto trip, which that is the best scene in the Kyoto trip in the game. Yeah. And I mean, it's the reason why the Kyoto trip exists yes. in the game, basically. Yeah. That scene is done phenomenally here, and it is the most visually arresting scene yeah. in the movie. And I think it might be the most visually arresting scene not done in the Dark Hour in this series. Yeah. Because even the one... 
in the second movie where they're out on the lake of like blood. That is during the dark hour where you where yeah. Yukari and uh, although Yuki you talk. do have since I just watched movie number two, they you do have a couple of moments. Particularly, it's when uh, Yuki first meets Igus, and they're both standing on that dock, and oh, they're like fantastic. on opposite sides of the frame, and it's like you just get like the like just sky blue, like that's really beautiful. Yeah, but the one here, it's it's where it's sunset and the water is orange, and it looks yeah. otherworldly, even though it isn't. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I should say about the animation in this movie, I mean, we've gone on at length about how good it is. Yeah, this movie has less of the dark hour stuff, but I still think there are no easy compositions. It's no. one of the things I love about these. Every converse, con, uh, composition, pound for pound, shot for shot, they never take the easy, let's just do a standard, you know, two shot or something. Yeah. It's always interesting and thoughtful and oftentimes just bizarre in some way. And I love it. It really is the Persona 3 cutscenes took to the nth degree. Yeah. And there's something that's actually kind of relaxing about this movie for like basically most of like the big middle chunk having no dark hour stuff at all. There's something I find kind of like about that, that there's, it, it feels like it, it, because so much about the themes of the movie are about going back to everyday life in different ways and sort of finding meaning back in that stuff. And it needs to be more normal. And so it's like, and they, but they, like you said, they do find ways to make that really visually arresting in different ways. And it's nice to see that sort of the more natural aesthetic come back and, and not always being in like the just like really crazy dark hour stuff. Yeah. No, it's fantastic. And it's nice to see that they have both kept these movies coming out relatively like clockwork. I think the delay between two and three was the biggest. But four is out now, so it's done. They've made the yeah. series. And there's never been compromises. Like, it's still... These can't be that big budget, but the animation looks big budget. Yeah. It looks phenomenal. Like, it's tough for me to point to other anime movies, especially on this scale, where they're not like a Ghibli or something, where they're a big movie movie. This is still a game adaptation. Yeah. And yet, it can punch with the best of them. It's really good visually. Yeah, yeah. the animation is... Spectacular, and as you said, like we've talked about that a lot on the discussions for the last two movies. But and I and I think we'll have a lot more to say probably with the fourth one. Yeah, man. And then it's like, it, but then also I feel like this is, I feel like we're kind of wrapping this up. You, like you get how strong the composition, the animation is when you get the teaser at the end of the credits. Oh, that's God. just the rooftop, and you have the windmills and just the sky. Like their use of color is so strong, and like them being able to use really solid colors at times to like really great minimalist effect and then also having like in the Kyoto scene some like really complex shades it's almost like watercolor or something where it's like really visually dynamic it's like their ability to command those both of those styles is really impressive but it is for me when they go for that super minimalist aesthetic aesthetic like that like brief rooftop stinger let's talk about that for a second fuck man each of the Persona 3 movies has ended with a teaser for the next one. Yeah. And I think movie one ended with Igus waking up. Yeah. Movie two, what's the ending of that? I, don't, I, I actually turned off the credits before okay. I got to that point. Cause I, had it's, I think it's something with the bridge or something. Something like that, two. yeah. yeah. Um, I think it might have been something with Pharaoh, so I don't remember. Yeah. But they're bigger. They're like little scenes. Like little tiny one minute vignettes. Yeah, that are like, like a little like thing that's very... It's almost kind of like the stinger to like in Marvel movie where it's like a little tip of your hat it's like yeah. oh hey this is that character that's going to be in the next movie and then it'll say you know Persona 3 the movie number 2 is coming soon yeah. and blah 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 this one is just they fade in on the roof there's no one on it and the windmills are just churning a little yeah. bit and then it fades in Persona 3 the movie last episode not even a coming soon and then fades out yeah it just like holds on that for like a minute good god that's that is that was a mic drop moment. Like, cause I yeah. was so curious about what the stinger was going to be, and when it faded in on that rooftop, I was like, "You guys completely understand how the story in that game worked, and like where the people who played it, where their emotional attachment is." And it's like it is amazing how unbelievably evocative that is for yes. someone who's a huge fan of that game. Just seeing that rooftop, and then just like, especially how like where it's placed and how it's framed, you're just like, "Fuck you!" Like, are you just? How are you trying to make me cry with a fucking post credit stinger, you assholes? It's... Holy l- shit. It's literally breathtaking. Yeah. Like, it literally, your breath catches in your throat for a moment. Yeah. When you realize that, like, that's what they're doing with it, and that it's not going to be, like, a single piece of dialogue or something. It's not going to be, like, Nick's coming out from, like, the sky or yeah. something. It's like, nope. Oh. It's just the rooftop, man. Because that's... Because I think that's one of the things that this movie gets, is that it's that's what the game is about. And it's why, like... Even though it feels like this movie kind of fumbles the Akutsuki scene a little bit, that's totally fine because that's not what the game is about and it's not what the movie is about. 
It's like that's stuff that needs to happen to get the plot to move forward. And it's fine if it's just a little bit messy because it's so much more about like that rooftop and it's about like that blue sky. It is not about like the big betrayal or anything like that, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, it's funny, you know, before these movies started coming out, my big question was, all right, you can probably do the characters and the story and have it all be good and fun, but how can you do the ending and make it anywhere near as powerful? Because it's so reliant on you having spent 60 to 80 hours in this world and yeah. having the experiential element. And yet we're at a point where I don't think it's going to necessarily match that, but it's going to make us fucking cry. Yeah. And that's enough. Like, it's going to hurt really, really bad when you get to that ending. It's going to have all those emotions it needs to have. And that is the miracle. Because how you adapt that, that's what adaptation is. Is getting to the same emotions by way of a different path. And they're doing that. Yeah. And it's going to be so... It's just it's going to hurt in such a strange way, too. Because you already have the version from the game. But, like... You didn't have this character in yes. the game. Like, they've made this character, and it's like... And again, it's what I said about, like, this movie feeling so tragic in so many of these scenes that, like, is, like, contingent on knowledge outside of the movie itself, where it's like, you know... It's like, you're just making this character happy again. It's like, you know all the shit that has to happen later. Like, you know that the friendship with is not going to work out, and you know that he's not going to make out of it okay, and you, like, making me care so much for this protagonist... It's like it's kind of like a big fuck you because we all already know what happens to him in the end. Yeah, no, it's amazing. And I cannot fucking wait. Yeah, I really want to see that last movie. It came out, I just checked, end of January in Japan. So I assume it'll be out by the end of the year on Blu-ray. That'd be cool. Um, it's usually been less than a 12-month window, so I think we'll have it maybe even this summer and that would be great. But because I think movie three might have taken a little extra to get on Blu-ray as well. Yeah, I it feel like it. But it's we we have it. We'll have four. I will have spent three hundred and twenty dollars when this is all over, and worth every penny. This has been a great series so far. Love having these Blu-rays because even if random ones will show up on Netflix, it's just nice to have the physical package. Yeah, on my shelf next to my Persona Four the animation DVDs. I've been thinking about picking up the golden animation Blu-rays they have. They're also eighty dollars a piece. Oh Jesus! It's it's two sets, six episodes a piece, but it comes with like soundtracks and like postcards and all this stuff. I'm like, it would be so irresponsible yeah. to spend the money that way. Because it's but like I kind of want to. But also, like I I do I did really enjoy the golden animation, but it's not as good as no. the the main series. Like it's a little bit it's a little bit messy, and it like there's no way it wasn't going to be. But it's yeah yeah I would not pay that much money for no. it. But you can watch it on Crunchyroll. Man. No, I know I can, <laughs> but it's like that's the thing. It's not about watching it. It's about the yeah. The fucking set, no. Um, anyway, it's it's funny. There's persona will make you spend money. Yeah. It's, what what Sean? What are we making and earning money for in this life if not persona merchandise? It's a very fair point because yeah. I mean I did buy the super extra special version of Dancing All Night, so I, I, I understand. Did too. I yeah. understand that I've, soundtrack is a really attractive offer. It is. I've God, that alone's worth the price. Yeah, it's phenomenal. I've got uh, my kind of was doing. Because I moved a couple months ago, so moving some boxes around, and I finally got my Persona 4 Dancing All Night and Persona Q, nice big box I have, and they're up on the fireplace next to the TV. Nice. And I put my Amiibo on top of them, so I could just have, like, I'll put all my collectible shit right in one. And that's right by the Chief Helmet. It's great. Nice. So anyway. Well, I think this podcast needs to come to an end at some point. It does. I, 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 I'm really sad that we only have one more of these to talk about, because yeah. this is one of my favorite kind of now annual traditions on the yeah, podcast. Yeah, it's like, it's been a nice event that we get to come back to every now and then, and it's, yeah. it's been really fun watching these movies. Yes, maybe at some point in the lead up to Persona 5 we could do blocks of Persona 4 The Animation or something like that. Sure, I would just watch that. It's been a long time since I yeah. saw that. Uh, and I got sidetracked watching it, so I haven't finished it, and I need to go back and do that, so... We could do that, and that could be fun because that I don't think that matches up to this, but it's really good in its own. No, way. yeah, it's still a lot of fun. Yeah, and damn, Persona, whatever this franchise touches is gold. It's a weird Midas effect. Yeah. I don't get. They could probably do a free to play game, and it'd be great. They have been knocking down every single challenge set up in front of them. Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right, so not sure what next week will be. I. I'm getting Fire Emblem Fates this week, so I'll be talking about that. I want to play XCOM 2 so fucking bad. God damn it. Buy a gaming PC. No, just kidding. <sighs> yeah, I'm going to spend like $100 no. billion dollars to get it. No. Hopefully there will be a console announcement soon. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, so I'll have Fire Emblem to talk about. Maybe you'll see Deadpool. Maybe not. Yeah, I'll try to see it. But we can talk about that. 
Um, and then, who knows, next week or the week after, at some point, we'll do our Pokemon episode. Because I want to do, as the, the 27th is when they're being re-released on 3DS, and I think that's the date they came out in Japan. So that would be the time to do it. Because right. that's the actual 20th anniversary. So we can start thinking about that. All right. And what Pokemon... There's, there's plenty to talk about with Pokemon. Yes. So that could be fun. And send questions if you have them. We don't get them that often, but on Twitter or... I'm at Jonathan Lack. You can do Tumblr, theweeklystuff.tumblr.com. Email stuff is on the site, jonathanlack.com. My name doesn't have an H in it. There's H in thin, not at the beginning, because that'd be a weird fucking spelling. But anyway, so, yeah. If you have Pokemon, we have questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, if you have, I'm excited to talk about Pokemon. Yeah. And, you know, more than anything else, Jonathan, I'm excited for a year from now when we get to watch Persona 3, the movie number four, and we just get to cry together on this podcast, and that's all it's going to be. Three hours of us just weeping into the microphone.